Hello and welcome to the Friday Nightmares podcast. Uh, recording from the horror basement in Flint, I am your host, Scott Crawford. And recording from beautiful, luscious Waterdown, Ontario, I am Heather Powell. As you can tell, this is the first time Scott and I in our history have three episodes <laughs> have recorded not in person. Uh, but we are recording recording through a software, so we can still gauge each other's reactions to try to capture that in-person quality that we adore. Um, and we probably will be doing this for the next two months for, um, well, I think we all know why. Yep, due to the wonderful uh, new world that we are living in. It's like War of the Worlds. It really is. Well, <laughs> War of the Worlds, 28 days later. Planet of the Apes. Planet of the Apes. Well, only I would take it for Apes to take over right about now. That would be interesting. Right. Um, now, mind you, Scott and I had already planned not to get together in March. I have some uh, health issues in my family and just issues with grad school. So we had already prepped to do this um, over Zoom or Skype or whatever. So that, that didn't inconvenience March. But unfortunately, in April, Motor City Nightmares which um, we were going to go to and I was going to record with Scott in person at the end of April has been canceled. Yeah, well, it got pushed back, but oh, yeah, sorry. pretty much pushed canceled back for us. I can't go in July, so I consider it canceled, I guess. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, canceled pretty much for us because yeah, like there's no way we'll both be able to make it. Um, but yeah, like pretty much everything in the world right now, things are just getting suspended and held and pushed back. So we're just hopefully going to do something else, which we'll talk about later. But uh, yeah. yeah, we have some other stuff up the pipe. And I think that, you know, really as annoying as this is, like I said to Scott, like right now, the border crossing would be a nightmare for people that are doing it now, you know, props to you. Um, but I feel for people because it would just be crossing the border is already a stressful enough experience, let alone adding this stuff on top of it. And I and, you know, props out to border guards on both sides because they're dealing with a lot of shit right now, too. Yes, they are. Well, shit, we should give a prop out to everybody like that's in the uh, grocery store industry, mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. health, health facilities, like all those workers deserve like kudos for the extra work they're having to put in and take care of all this crap that's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a tough time. It really does feel like a horror movie. I watched A Quiet Place last night and I'm like, oh man, that grocery store looks like Walmart. <laughs> yeah. It is. We are living in a real-life post-apocalyptic horror film right now. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's in all the horror fans find a lot of humor in it. But in all fairness, people, like, obviously, like, do your best. Stop hoarding toilet paper. Um, yeah. You know, think of your neighbor. Don't yeah, do cause, shit. Yeah, because, it, like, it's, it's getting crazy out here. Um, me and my roommate went to Meyer last night, and, yeah, like you said, it's like a quiet place. The shelves were empty, and luckily we were going in there for a printer, so... We had no issue there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? You know, everyone's like, please, please buy something. I, we went out to eat last night just, just to support local business. You know, like I think that um, and the local Thai place that we like to go to, that even he was like, yeah, my business is down uh, 15, 20% right now. And that's, and that's shitty. Like these are the people that are suffering. It's small businesses and stuff. So, you know, I don't want to tell people to put yourself at risk. And I'm obviously not a health expert, but if you're comfortable enough to go to you at least get, you know, get takeout, you know, like you can pick it up and bring it home and eat it. Like something. Right. Like well, this is going. Someone had made a post. I can't remember who it was, but this was a brilliant idea. People said to support, especially local restaurants that will be having issues. Just go there, buy gift cards. Uh, yeah. And then just uh, after all this has gone over, take your kids, your family, your dates, whoever, out to nice dinners. Yeah, if you're not comfortable with going out now, that's a really great thing. But we were the only ones in the restaurant last night, so talk about social distancing. It probably was busier in the grocery store. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, and the crazy part is even uh, theaters are doing this social distancing thing now. I just read uh, that AMC and Regal have put these huge cushions between every other seat. That way people are spaced out more and they're not uh, selling as many tickets that way. But they're like, yep, just to keep people... A little further away and not shut down the theater well and also keep people coming right like yeah but i think this will tell listeners all they need to know about me because i thought this is funny so i um 
I have not been someone that has stocked up on anything. I, I have not gone to the grocery store. I have not changed my shopping habits, my going out habits. The only thing I have not done is cross the border. That is the only thing that would be different that I would usually do coming up to around this time or in April that I haven't done. So anyway, I'm on a, my Facebook group with my community. And here in Ontario, for all my Canadian loving friends, we have something called the LCBO, which is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. So that's where we buy all our liquor. And I saw that the LCBO was busy and I panicked. And I'm like, holy shit, I got to get the LCBO. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to the LCBO and I didn't overbuy. Some people were buying like cases of wine and, and shit. I just wanted to buy enough for the weekend because I was off yesterday and I didn't want to have to go and buy more, right? right. But even then, like I, I didn't have that much. I had like a two six packs of beer and some ciders and like a bottle of wine. I felt like the need to explain to the clerk, like, oh no, no, like I'm not I'm not hoarding. This is <laughs> And then I'm like, oh, I have a drinking problem, right? Like, either way, you look bad. But yeah, that was like the only thing that made me react yesterday. I was like, oh, shit. I better go now before it's after work and it gets even worse. And I would put it to the same busyness that you would have the day before a stat holiday. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's not too bad. Yeah, but that's, that tells all the listeners that this is what my needs are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Luckily for us, even if we had to, like, somehow self-quarantine, my roommate and I had got groceries week before all this madness happened so like it wasn't even like oh this is gonna affect us no we just did our usual grocery shopping and now we're just we're good so you didn't stockpile on booze like i did and (laughs) i did buy a 12 pack and you know how often i drink so yeah that's true well we drink a lot when we're together that's yeah the most alcohol that or when it or that when we're recording it's not horror okay oh yeah that too (laughs) so yeah we'll be good three months of of dry livers before we (laughs) yeah but this will (laughs) This will give you an example of what it's like in Michigan right now, because I had one roll of toilet paper left, so I was like, well, shit, I got to go at least buy a 12-pack. This is before everything got worse, and I get a, I get to the store, and of course, shelves are like almost barren. I found a 12-pack, and I'm walking up to the register, and everyone is just giving me this evil eye, and I'm going... <laughs> I'm not hoarding. I'm just getting necessity here. Well, and you're buying one pack. Yeah. Right. But, oh my God. Every like, yeah, this, I could see this being like the Black Friday chaos just for freaking toilet paper. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. Right. And it's just really funny because I, you know, being a female, I could see being a house of two dudes, not like fucking having toilet paper, but like, you know, I, I'm pretty regular with how much I buy toilet paper. Or we buy toilet paper and like, it's, it's funny because I'm not even concerned about that. And I'm more concerned for elderly people, to be honest with you. Those are the people I'm worried yeah. about is, um, you know, they're the ones most susceptible to the flu or, covid or whatever so anyway stay for safe friends hopefully 28 days doesn't happen and if it does happen i hope i'm a cool ass zombie let me tell you that much like i hope i'm one of those zombies that like not days of the dead zombies like 28 days like infected shit where i'm like crazy and stuff like i'd be down for that yeah just go in complete berserk mode yeah if i'm my husband just kidding and <laughs> <laughs> just kidding um but yeah or is like, she <laughs> but not like night of the living dead remember how fucking stupid those zombies look i don't want to be dumb all right yeah. i want to be angry yeah i don't want to be slow shambling and decaying i want to just be like full of energy and psychotic like fuck shit up right like anyway all right let's uh let's get into what we've been watching and listening to mr crawford do you want to go first um sure i'll say um because we've uh, you and I have definitely been watching a lot of uh, the 2020 films as they've been coming out and just watching because we have also challenged ourselves to watch only first time watches throughout this year just to kind of broaden our spectrum of the horror films that are out there. Obviously, we'll take breaks and watch like stuff during like traditional stuff like Friday the 13th. We'll watch Friday the 13th or Christmas time. We'll watch Christmas horror films, you know, things like that. But yeah, so you and I have been just pretty much just watching all sorts of stuff good mm-hmm. bad horrible but it's all been weird 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 yeah weird uh so one of the ones that you and i decided to watch because you know i think people know that we watch movies through skype together just as we're you know chatting as we watch the movie but yeah. um one of the movies that it's pretty high up on my year-end list right now because it impacted me so freaking much and that is after midnight yeah which is pretty much about a uh relationship that has gone stale Mm -hmm. but involves a monster that shows up whenever the uh girlfriend is not there Mm -hmm. and holy crap i 
like I, you and I were both like we were messaging each other back and forth but then there was like that one part because at first we're like we don't see how this is a horror film like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like this seems more like a drama and then you know it, to some it still won't be a horror film it just has horror elements which you mm-hmm. know I can see if people won't want to add that to their horror lists at the end of the year or whatever but for me it definitely affected us because they affected me because uh we ended up just saying all right let's stop talking right now and listen to this scene and it went on for like 10 minutes of the main character and his girlfriend and just the interaction between the two and the whole uh you know where they were going in their relationships and just that scene alone like shot this movie way up on my list because yep i related to that so freaking much because if most Mm -hmm. people don't know i had went through a divorce a little over a year and a half ago and yeah this relationship felt pretty realistic to me and felt like what i had lived through yeah and and i scott and i are both divorced and we've short shared uh war stories my my relationship was not like this story um but even me watching it was like oh my god like scott is watching and i think i even said to you one time i think you're watching yourself on screen yeah <laughs> like yeah, that's it was exactly what it was it was very very interesting um and you know i i think that um that movie i can see why people might not like it um i enjoyed it a lot i I still like i the horror label is you know i could get why people maybe give or take it but i think no matter what it's an interesting film but you really do have to enjoy a lot of storytelling it's not the quickest film in the world um, it's not the highest budget film in the world, filled in, film in the world, but you know what? They make use of the budget they have, and I like that. I like when films know what they are, and I've, you've heard me say this a billion times on this podcast, and they utilize their funds effectively. Maybe not crazy scenery, scenery basic costumes. Um, if they do reveal areas that need more special effects, it's done well, because yep. they're saving their money for that. Yeah, and you know this will come up a lot in this episode, I think, but... Uh... You know, they did a great job of keeping the monster in the shadow until the final reveal. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, the monster was weird. It, I wouldn't say it looked bad. It was just a weird design. But one thing I will say about this movie, holy shit, the final jump scare in the film. Yeah, really oh, well done. Oh my God, that, because you, even you, you were saying like your heart was racing after that. Like same with me, like, <laughs> like that one just had our hearts going because like, we did not, we did not see it coming at well, all. Well, I screamed and poor, my poor dog was like, what the fuck? <laughs> 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 um, like it, it definitely startled me, uh, huge. Now I get startled easily, but this really startled me. Yeah. And I don't, I don't get scared very easily, like jump started like that. And that one actually, because I was like half laying down on my couch watching, because when I, watch movies i just kind of chill and when that scene happened i jumped and was straight sitting straight up going holy shit (laughs) yeah it was crazy it was crazy 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 but yeah that i i highly recommend this it's not going to be for everybody but it's one that especially if you can relate to any of these characters it will be something that is at least uh an interesting watch and a very interesting done interestingly done film absolutely yeah, for sure. And how about you? Well, I'm going to start off with a movie I didn't get. Okay, so we'll get to the good watches. But Jessica Forever came out on Shudder. I think oh, yeah. uh, around Valentine's Day. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't, So for any listeners that are out there that watch this movie and understands what was going on, can you please post in our Facebook group? Because... Um, I didn't get it. No, I got a concept. Um, there's a there's a world apocalypse in in France, and uh, this woman named Jessica is a leader of basically orphan boys who are seen as evil. And it goes through a series of like people joining this group, leaving this group. But throughout the whole thing, I I didn't I didn't understand why a it was on Shutter. B, why people liked it so much. And, you know, I'm not at all going to attack the movie and say it was bad because it was filmed well. Um, the acting seemed good. I don't think the acting was bad. I just didn't understand it. So maybe it's just not a Heather film and maybe someone else out there gets it. But, um, yeah. So please, if anyone understands Jessica Forever, 
make a post in our page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. Because <laughs> I'm curious because after, because while you were watching it, you were messaging me and just going, oh, Scott, I, I, nope, this, I just don't understand this film. I don't even see how it's horror. So like with basing it off your reactions, I avoided watching it right now. Yeah, I, I don't. Wanna, I'm kind of curious to see what it. others thought. <laughs> like, I and I, I haven't heard anybody talk about it yeah, in any I'll, other podcast or anything like that. Well, hell, and I've been on, you know, like the group that I'm in, the Talking Films group. There is someone that watches something in that film. Like, there's always somebody that watches movies that no others have, and not even on there did anyone mention Jessica Forever, and that's kind of surprising. Now, it is a subtitled film, and I want to assure the, the listeners, I can read. Um, so <laughs> Are you sure about that? Um, yes, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't a literacy issue. And yet again, the, the acting seemed fine. The, I just didn't understand the plot. I didn't understand the plot. And there was a lot of silence in it. And sometimes I feel like this was... And I have a big beef with artistic films that are artistic for the sake of being artistic. Yeah. And I really felt like that's what this film was doing. But you know what? I'm always open to be wrong. So uh, anyone seen it, please post. Yes, I would be very curious to see someone else's opinion, just out, just out of curiosity. Huh. And who knows? Maybe this will encourage someone to check it out and then get back to us about it. Yeah, yeah watch it and tell us. Can you explain yeah. it to us? That'd be great. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I'll jump into one, and this one is one that we both watched that, uh, we actually just watched this last Sunday, so figure if we're gonna kind of go on the ones that are our least favorites right now. <laughs> oh yeah, might as well, right? Yeah. Work up, work up the ladder to the better side of things. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, this one was, because at the time we were hoping there'd be something, something new on Shutter, so we were trying to just kind of scroll through, see what was, what was to rent, and Thank you, Mark Nato, for being such an awesome person and writing a list down of every movie and when they are coming out during the month and sharing it on Facebook, because that has really helped us like, keep up on our 2020 film watches. Yes, thank you for doing all the work, Mark Nato, and sharing it with us. Yeah, it is impressive. And yeah, I'll just give a shout out here and just say, you know, people, if you are into horror podcasts, especially intellectual style horror podcasts, Check out the horror cast. Great, great show. Now, Mark Nato doesn't like Terrifier, and that's the only thing he has going against him. Yep. Everything else that Mark Nato does is great. So either the Rotten Round Table or the horror cast that now has, I believe, Mr. Watson. Yep. Um, um, Brandon. Brandon from Anatomy of Fear. <laughs> Matt, thank you. And Taminator. Yes. My queen is on there as well, too. Um, so yeah, they're, they're great to listen to. And Rotten Roundtable, he has rotating guests as well. And Mark Nato's just a fun guy, man. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, I, we used his list that he put together because he used to just put him on the show and everyone was just asking him like, Hey, can we at least, uh, get a list? Cause it's hard to write these down if we're listening and driving and stuff like that. So him putting the extra work in, just want to say, give a shout out and say thank you for that. Cause that helped us out though. The movie we chose uh, was... <laughs> we, we we chose poorly on this one but it was uh called a wakefield project which is just this little indie horror film that felt almost like it was gonna turn into a porn any minute it could have been any minute and it would have been a better movie <laughs> yeah and you know us we don't like to trash movies but there was something about like there was just not much redeeming for this one for me like i I was looking and looking for things like I liked the music in the beginning, but then they just played it over and over again. Yeah. They, they really utilized the soundtrack and the acting, like it was a small budget film for the small budget film. It was fine. You know, like I think that, you know, when you're, you got actors like that, that are probably just honing their cat craft or learning how to do it. Like I lower my expectations. It's like when I watch an uncorked film. Yeah. You know, I, I don't go in there expecting it to be a Bloomhouse masterpiece. Not that every Bloomhouse film is good, but the acting in that Bloomhouse, like they did Get Out, for example, you know, like obviously the quality of that acting and the quality of like Derailed, which was an uncork film that I've watched, is not going to be to the same, right? So you, you take it for where it's at. I This is a step above. Jessica Forever is my last rated movie on um, my top 20 list. This is the second last because at least I understood the plot. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and this one is my this one is on my least rated so far. Like my the one that like my least favorite of the year so far. But you know, that's you know, each person's gonna have something different and come out of this differently. But yeah, this one it was basically about uh the uh veil between the living and the dead somehow uh disappears and people can start seeing the dead and seeing the living well sometimes that part was screwed up because like they were trying to make it sound like this was happening all the time and you can see the dead all the time but then there's other times where they couldn't see the dead so i yeah i think it's supposed to be a 12 hour thing um anyway i i I don't want it like in case someone decides that they do want to watch it i think it was filmed in canada a lot of movies are filmed in Canada. Yeah, we're starting, like to, small I'm starting to realize Ontario, that. <laughs> right? Um, I, it's definitely not worth the five ninety nine that we paid. Maybe no. on Netflix, if you're really a fan of indie horror and you really want to like... Just watch everything. Support somebody, rock on. But I would say that it's not... Like, I was, I was counting the minutes till the movie was done. Like, I was like, all right. Like, I think if we hadn't paid for it, we would have shut it off. But because we yeah. paid for it, we, we saw it out. Yep, we decided to be stubborn and stick it out through it. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, that one we'll just say you know if you're in, if you are wanting just to watch something and you see it free streaming somewhere, why not? But yeah, don't rent it. Like like I and mean, you gotta, you gotta really you like support. indie. Like you really gotta be. Maybe maybe you're a filmmaker, an aspirational filmmaker, and you want to watch this to see what a low budget filming quality could be like. Right. That is honestly the only people I think that will enjoy this because it really, yet again, I think they did what they could with their budget, but the plot was just all over the place. A lot of things didn't follow up and make sense. The acting was, you know, what you expect for that kind of film. Right. So yeah, I went, I think there's better indie movies to watch. I think this is more about you want to be a filmmaker. Here's an idea of what you may be working with. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> right. Like, so but definitely not worth purchasing do not spend your money on this movie it is not going to be good for you in the long haul yep, we, we did the hard work for you yeah we did it for you don't don't watch it um compared to the farm what, what would you watch again you have to watch one of these um, movies again scott which one are you watching i'm watching the farm yeah i would watch the farm too <laughs> you guys know how much we love that movie so um I'm going to move into not 2020, but just something that I could not stop watching. So Insidious is coming out with their fifth movie this year. Which I had no idea was even a thing. (laughs) Yes. And I have avoided the Insidious movies because, spoiler, I am a big chicken when it comes to ghosts. I believe in them. I don't touch Ouija boards. I believe in demons. I believe in evil. Okay. I believe in evil. I believe in evil entities. I believe in all that stuff. I've subscribed to it 110%. So I've avoided insidious because if anyone has even seen a trailer for this, it does deal with paranormal, paranormal underworld, ghost, demons, etc. So I decided to put on my big girl, Heather pants and watch the first one. And I binge watched three on prime in a day, which is a lot yeah. for me because I have a lot of balls up in the air. So it's very difficult for me to watch multiple movies at some given time. And I watched these three and I loved them. Yeah. And that, and with, cause you know, you and I, we pick on each other's tastes sometimes, but at the same time, we both respect each other's opinion. And I've avoided these cause I just, they didn't look interesting to me at first, but hearing your reaction and just you telling me about them made me want to watch them so i've actually got them queued up and ready to go after like pretty much when we're done recording and like have a little break between our next episode because i did a lot of show prep for this one but i definitely plan on knocking those three films out here very soon and then see if i can find the last key streaming somewhere or see if i'll have to rent it it is honestly i will watch the last key i will rent it um but the first three, I, the one and two go into each other. So you do have to watch one to two back to back. They actually all go into each other. And the fir- at the end of the first one, you wonder how they're going to make this into a sequel with some of the characters. And they managed to do it quite well. Lynn Shay is fucking phenomenal. Um, I, I love her as an actress. You know, I, I just really like her character. And I love how she, uh, she's got some good lady balls, let me put it that way, in this movie. 
and I, uh, I, I love it. There was some parts that definitely made me jump. And yet again, I buy into the whole demons and, and stuff like that. I, I believe in that. I subscribe to it. Um, and I, I thought it was really, really well done. Nice. Yeah. Cause I, and I, and I know like you even posted it on our Facebook page and a lot of people seem to be pretty much right where you are and loving the series. Yeah, it's a, and I want to talk about another series quickly, if you don't mind, Scott, that oh, I didn't like as much. And this is not a hit at anyone that likes this series. So I've been trying to watch the Saw movies, okay? Um, <clears throat> I've seen the first one. I've now seen the second one. And I've seen the last three. Jigsaw and then the other two. And props to the people that like this. I can understand why you like this, these movies. But I just can't get into it. I find uh, the main character, is it John? Uh, just, uh, yeah, Jigsaw. 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 He's a real name, and I think it's John. But anyway, um, I find him annoying. No, not the, like, the actor does a great job. I just, I find the whole purpose around Saw doesn't make any sense to me. It just seems to me like this dude is pissed off, and he's psycho, and that seems to be okay. Oh, I guess it's not really okay, but, and, and the kills are great. Like, they're over the top. They get more over the top as the series goes on. Um... And the filming I find weird. They do these flashback things and then this like move to this scene and move to that scene. Just not my jam. But yet again, I understand why other people like it. But I was kind of sad that it wasn't my jam because like on paper, this sounds like my kind of series. And I just just didn't like, I I would probably watch it if it was on TV, but to sit down and, and watch through the rest of them. I don't know. Maybe I will one day when I got nothing else going on, but like, just couldn't, I just couldn't sink my teeth into it. I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Scott? Um, well, I have watched every single one of them except for Jigsaw, the very last one. I'm sure I'll get around to that at some point just because I, I, like I've told you, I'm a sucker for just watching a franchise, especially if I've watched from the beginning to the end and a new one comes out, I'll still give it a watch. But yeah, I really enjoyed the first one. Like, especially because that was a really fresh idea and the twist at the end was nothing I would have ever expected. Mm -hmm. The second one I like more as almost like a house of horrors slash slasher film. Mm -hmm. But like the rest of the series, the story gets so convoluted and like they keep pretty much, uh, it's almost like a snake or a dog chasing its own tail, just over and over and over again, just circling and rehashing the same stuff and they tend to get lost because they add something else to the plot that is what happens in the past so they got to find a way to work that into the new movies and it just it gets so ridiculous and the i will say the kills are uncomfortable and brutal so Mm -hmm. if you're a gore hound hell yes like i mean a lot of people have seen the saw series because you know it was so damn popular but yeah like all in all it was an okay franchise to me like it's not something I would just be like, oh, I'm going to watch this every year like I do Friday the 13th type deal. Yeah, it surprised me, honestly. Like, I like Hostel 2. I love that movie. I think it's Yeah, fucking Hostel 2 is the best out of the that. The bomb. Out of those and, three. like, I get why people like Saw. Out of, yet again, this is not a hit at people that like Saw. I was just shocked I really didn't like it. And I thought, oh, I'll try other films and, and stuff. I don't know. Maybe three or four is going to, like, suddenly nail it down for me. Um, but I just, I, yeah, not not feeling it. Not yeah, me. yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can get that. I seen, I think it was two and three in theaters, and then I waited a couple of years because I was burnt out at that point, and then decided to finish off the series when like Jigsaw three or Saw three D came out, and I was like, all right, now that this is available on Comcast on demand, I will watch it here and watch the entire series from the beginning to the end, just so I can say I watched it. And yeah. It was. It is what it is. That's a good way to look at it. And I guess I'll let you go next because maybe we should start. Unless you have some other non um, favorites, I have. We have a couple of favorites that we watched that we can talk about as well. Yeah, there was one. I um, yeah, I don't have any non favorites left that I would uh, bring up. But I do have uh, one that's not a 2020 film that heard a couple things about and decided to finally sit down and watch it, and I was really impressed. And that is late phases mm. which is basically about a uh an old blind man ends up getting put in a nursing home community 
Like, so like each person has their own, their, each elderly person has their own house in this community and people come by and check on them every day and help them with anything they need. But while they're in this community, like it seems like every time there's a full moon, a werewolf attacks and kills off a couple of people. And it's, uh, and the guy that is blind is a war veteran. So he's a badass that has guns and stuff like that. But this was a really well done werewolf movie with a pretty good storyline and mystery behind it. And just an interesting setting, setting it in like an elderly community setting like that. Like it is, I really recommend this movie to anyone that loves werewolf films and wish there'd be some good ones. Cause this is up there for me and probably like my top five werewolf movies. That's awesome. I'll have to check it out. It sounds like COVID virus is a werewolf killing off all the old people. Just kidding. Oh, Ooh, relevant. Like, too soon, Heather. Um, but no, it sounds, that sounds actually really good. I like when they do like seniors. Yeah. With this kind of stuff. I think that's cool. Yeah. And you really relate with a lot of these characters, which is awesome. They f- spend a lot of time with the people in this community and you, you can relate and you feel bad for them when something bad happens to them. Yeah, absolutely. And- and when that final act kicks in, holy crap, it is just like werewolf action out the ass. It is awesome. Nice. I'll have to check it out. I, you know, I'm really digging the werewolf movies. I, we saw Dog Soldiers, and we covered that on Kill the Cast. So I'm not going to yep. go too into that. But man, that was a good movie, too. Like, I, I love the whole werewolf folklore thing. I think it's cool. Yeah, it's just unfortunate because there's a lot of really bad ones that just... Mm. It's because werewolf movies are hard... For some reason, are hard to get right. And I don't know why they are hard to get right probably the work that goes into the costumes and the transitions and stuff like that like if you don't have the money for a good transitions or like cgi people get so pissed off with cgi all the time and i'm that kind of person that like unless it's really bad cgi i don't it doesn't bother me um right. but some people have really good eye for it like you do for example you can tell when something's really really well done and i'm like no nah, it's fine so like i i think that um that's probably why it's hard to do it well yeah, because like when you're doing practical effects with a werewolf cost- like costume, that takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And especially mm-hmm. if you're going to try to one up or even compete with uh, American Werewolf in uh, London, because that is, you know, still to this day, one of the best werewolf transformations ever shown on screen. And there are some people that try to compare themselves with that and try to do that. And it's not easy to do, but that was because of the special makeup effects of Rick Baker, who is a freaking master at special effects. Yeah. You got like a lot of these other people that are doing pretty good, but yeah, like sometimes the werewolves look silly or just different. And, you know, I like the, uh, like, I think we got into this a little bit on Kill the Cast, but I'm also a huge fan of the bipedal werewolves, the ones that are still humanoid looking, but they're werewolves or they're wolves. Mm-hmm. I'm not a mm-hmm. like I love the ones that just turn into regular wolves. There can be some good ones, but they're not like my go to favorite t- style werewolf movie. Well, we all have our preferences, right? Yeah. Right? And that's the best thing about horror is that there tends to be something for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got to say about late phases, though. It, uh, for the US, it is on Shudder. So hopefully you have it on Shutter in Canada. Who knows? We're behind. We we just got um, DVD players <laughs> <laughs> last week. Oh. <laughs> really exciting. No, I'm sure. You know what's funny, though, is that Scott and I will compare all the time. Like, oh, is this for free for you on Prime? Or is this on your, you know, the only thing that's consistent is Tubi. Yeah. If, it, if it's on Tubi, um, and I think it's because it's global to be prime because it's a subscription service, same with shutter, but it's weird because, um, like, even though shutter is, and, and prime are similar, we could still have very different things that are free. It's right. like, well, it's a bin address, right. Of wherever your bin address is located. Yeah. And it's weird. Cause you know, you're using my shutter account. So it's like, oh, yeah, so yeah. I wasn't going to say that because I wasn't sure if you wanted me to, yeah, but I, I am. Yeah. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I gave her my Shutter account shortly after we started hanging out, and like, yeah, she's like, "Oh, like when I think when we did our first episode, you're like, oh, Lords of Chaos is on a Shutter." I'm going, "Wait, really?" And I go to look, and no, it's not. Yeah, it is. That's weird. And then find out it's on Hulu for me. Yeah, it's real, and we don't have Hulu in Canada. Yeah, we found that out recently. We don't got no Hulu. Canada gets no Hulu. That's how it rolls here. Yeah, Disney but, does not like you guys apparently. Yeah, Disney's like, screw you, Canada. <laughs> but um. To move to a movie that really affected me. Yes. That Mark Nato suggested was Live Scream. 
Oh my God, this movie was awesome. So this movie is video on demand and it is worth the money you will pay. Now it's not a high tech film. It's a very basic film. There's, there's one actor really in the entire film, but it, it, it plays on video games and haunted video game. And what I really like, and this, if you're a listener to this show, you know, I'm all about social themes. It plays on social isolation and what we have created in society with technology. Yeah. And one thing I will say, it's, uh, this hits on the Twitch stream community of people that love to watch uh, other people play video games. And yeah, like you were saying, there's only pretty much one actor in the movie, but there's like at least like 20 characters that are in the chat groups that you don't see any images of them except for like one scene. And they actually build characters just from the chat messages and you feel sorry or angry for certain people. Yeah. Like, yep. I will say, I actually shed a tear. Like, this actually got me emotional at a certain point. Same with me. You know, it, right now it's my number one movie. And for some people, this may not be your jam. Um, and that's fine. But I really liked it. The, while we were still watching it, I followed the main actor on Instagram. Yep, same here. Because I I liked him so much. And I'm not someone that pays for autographs. I would pay for an autograph to meet this dude and get him to sign a copy of this movie. And I would buy this movie. And I don't don't buy a lot of DVDs. That's how much I personally liked it. And again, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, everyone out there will like it. If you like, if you liked Unfriended, if you liked Friend Request, um, if you liked any of that stuff, you will probably like this film. And I think if you're a video game player, you will like this film as well. Yep, which is, um, that is like one thing that hit on me because I'm, uh, I was a big avid gamer. I haven't played much lately, but, you know, I know this community very well, like the Twitch streaming style community. And um, like, I've, I never understood watching someone play a video game, like through my computer or through my TV when I, because I look at it and go, I'd much rather be playing the game myself. But, this actually like with one of the characters in the chat group and what they were talking about actually made me go, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And I could see why people get behind this to watch these people. And yeah, like I, this is my number two right now of the year. It's competing with after midnight. Like it's, it's between those two are going back and forth. Cause I'm having a hard time. Cause this one had such an impact on me as well. And it's pretty much you are watching someone play a video game. Like you have his screen where you see him, but at the same time you have a bigger screen showing the game that he's playing. So you just got like, if you are into watching someone play video games, or if you're into, like you were saying, friend request, unfriended Mm -hmm. movies like that style that use the uh, computer screen style technology. Why use social media and internet as, as a form of social communication and, and what the impact of that is. Yeah. And yeah, I highly recommend this movie to anybody and it is worth renting and it is worth buying. And yeah. I don't buy movies as much as I used to. And I would, I would like to own a copy of this. Yeah, I, I loved it. And yet again, may not be for everybody, but I really enjoyed it. Right well, up hell, there. It will, it will be on my top 10 list by the time we finish this year. Oh, for sure. And hell, this will show how much of an impact it had on you because after we finished watching it, you went back to the beginning and started watching it again. I did. And I don't do that. I don't yeah. do rewatches usually. It's true. So that, that, that's when I said, okay, yep, this is definitely going to be on high on Heather's list when I've seen that happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love the, uh, the social inter- impact of it, right? Like, that always gets me going, so, yeah. Yeah, and I've never had a horror film, or at least it's been a long time since I've had a horror film make me feel emotion like that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, because we were even watching it while we were on video, and, you know, obviously we were watching the movie, but we both looked at each other, and we both seemed like tears running down our eyes and shit Oh, my like God, that. yeah, we were, we were leaking all over the place. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, that one got us big time. Yeah. Uh, and I think we just have one more that we were going to talk about, and this one has been a pretty popular one that are, like, in the, for this year, and that is VFW by Joe Bagos, the guy that did Bliss, and uh, The Mind's Eye. And it's pretty much about a group of veterans that chill at a VFW. So if you don't know what a VFW it is, it's a thing in America that is a veteran for foreign wars. It's a little 
little bar slash like club for the veterans that have been through wars to like have a place to just chill and talk with other like-minded individuals. Um, and I think in Canada it was legions. Yep. Legions. Yep. So similar. So if there's any Canadian listeners, similar to legions and like, I know like I, as soon as the movie started or not as soon as it started, but like as soon as you got into the VFW hall, like it instantly brought back a wave of nostalgia for me. Cause my stepdad, is a band member or plays in a band and he plays at a lot of local bars or he used to. And one of the places he used to go to was VFW halls. So when me and my brother were younger, we'd go there and watch him play. And this looked like every single VFW hall I've ever seen. And it just like, Holy crap. The, like it's like I'm back in my childhood, but except for minus the fact that yes, these guys are chilling in a VFW hall that get attacked by drug crazed punks and it turns into assault on precinct 13 mixed with a zombie night of the living dead style zombie movie where it's just they're isolated inside this building and just have hundreds of these killers just trying to break in and kill them because they stole they have some drugs i feel like uh joe is it joe bega joe bagos definitely has an issue with drugs um, or yeah. wants to promote the date. I'm just kidding. Between <laughs> right. Bliss and uh, and this movie, uh, definitely some drug awareness. But yeah, this movie was awesome. So awesome. I don't. I don't think we should talk too much like about it. I think you just need to watch it. Um, the acting is phenomenal. And yet again, it's nice to see um, more mature folks. Yeah, and they had a great take. cast. Yeah, and the acting in it is good. And these are seasoned dudes, right? Like, and they really gave that whole chiseled approach. And it's a it's an easy watch. It's a fun watch. I wish we had got in the theaters up here, but we're not like Mr. Venom, who lives in L.A. and it's every yeah. single movie in the theaters. But yeah, this would have been an awesome theater watch. But definitely buy this movie, rent it, whatever you need to do. Support this uh, director. He is good. He makes good films. And I think this is a movie that gives the example of being artistic. And I feel the same way about Blitz. It's artistic with quality to it. It doesn't yeah. just rely on bright lights and music and, you know, different types of filming to make the film interesting. It's followed up with a solid plot, good acting, great outcomes. Like it is a entertaining movie that you can watch again and again. Absolutely. Like this is going to be one that I could rewatch yearly. It's just a fun action horror and you can definitely tell joe bagos directed this because it has that very similar style as bliss does with like the way it's all set up in the angles and the camera light and the lighting and all that he's got a very unique style and i definitely see that in his films and i cannot wait to see what he can like, see the next couple of movies he comes out with absolutely absolutely now, are you ready to move into our what we've been listening to? Because I kind of want to include that with what we've been watching. Yep. Are you good? Okay. Yep. This is a new segment we decided, like the Heather decided to add, and I love this idea. So we decided to uh, do a what we've been listening to segment now. Yeah, I wanted to support other podcasters. You know, um, we listen to a lot of different podcasts, either on the Hill of Horophilia Network, the Legion Network, as well as independent podcasters. And I thought it would be nice for us to give a shout out to these podcasts and encourage you guys to listen to them. So the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, part of my Canadian brotherhood, Bay of Blood, with Mr. Will Carnell, Rob the Doll, Glenn, and I believe Corey or Carrie. And I think there's probably another person that I've forgotten that's on that show. Um, it's a great commentary. They pick different movies and they, and they basically just shoot the shit about it. Will is French Canadian and is extremely hilarious. So for any of my Canadian brother and sisters that are out there, you'll listen to him and know for sure that he's a Quebecer. Um, and I love their flow. I think they're really easygoing guys. They, um, they, they razz each other. So, you know, you got to be okay with some rough language and, and inappropriate jokes. But honestly, like, there's a lot of podcasts that are out there like that. So, you know, I probably wouldn't listen to this around your family. But it's, it's definitely a fun listen to. Now, Scott's been on Bay of Blood. So maybe he can talk a little bit more, too. Yeah. Um, it was just me, uh, Glenn, and Will Cardinal. But it was a kind of last-minute uh, show that we des he, they decided to have me on. I was at work, and Will messaged me just going, hey, would you like to uh, – join us tonight for just kind of like a introductory style get to know you podcast i'm like yeah that sounds fun he's like yeah we'll just shoot the shit about horror in general 
Little did I know that when I got on that I would be getting bombarded by like a million questions that were like, what are my favorite movies and what do I think about this and this and this. And it was a good test, litany test for me to uh, like come up with something on the fly. But man, I had a lot of fun talking with these gentlemen. They, they are hilarious. They have a uh, great taste in movies and are uh, just a blast to record with. And the episode ended up going for quite a long time, which I did not expect, which uh, by the end of it, I was pretty drunk and starving because I hadn't ate any dinner and started drinking while I was talking because I'm like, oh, this will only be like a two hour show close to four hours later. And I'm going, all right, guys, I'm (laughs) drunk. I'm starving. I need to go. (laughs) But it was a blast. And hopefully that episode will be coming out soon. I know they just released the episode that was before that. Uh, just recently so I'm thinking maybe next week that one will come out and you can find them on the Horrorphilia Network we'll include links to uh, all the podcasts that we talk about here and I Scott and I both encourage you to check them out so I'll let Scott talk about our next podcast friends yep our next uh, crew of uh, friends would be from the Horror Returns podcast with Lance Langford and Brian Stitcher I'm sorry I think there might be one other but I cannot remember his name right now and I feel like shit but we have, I have been a fan of theirs for quite some time, and they usually do a new movie versus an old movie that has a similar theme, and they just kind of talk about those and review those films. And uh, I will be actually recording with them tonight for their March Madness episode, and where we're going to be going to, like putting up uh, different final girls and final guys in horror films on a March Madness style bracket and just kind of putting them against each other. And so that one's going to be fun. It's going to be like a who's who of podcasting on there. But yeah, these guys know what they're talking about and they release episodes constantly and I love their banter and I love the way they review movies and it's just going to be a blast recording with them. And then Heather and I will actually also be recording with them uh, sometime next week, which will be a lot of fun. And their flow is so good. Like when I listened to their end of year episode and there was movies that were listed on there that were in my top, particularly Velvet Bloodsaw, Bloodsaw Gentleman that you went off about what a horrible movie it was. But I enjoyed listening to them. I think that they, they bring um, all different personalities to it. It's, it's easy listening. I love the Texas accent that Lance brings. Oh, um, yeah. as well good old but southern yeah, boy good old southern um but yeah they're great and i would say that this one's a little more of a cleaner podcast like they do swear and stuff like that on there but i wouldn't i don't think they get very inappropriate um not that that's a bad thing inappropriate can be fun but they right. stick very much to what the movies are that they're talking about and they do a very good job of walkthroughs so they're great i i recommend them as well and i'm so looking forward to working with them yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun i I'm excited. And yeah, I definitely recommend you give them a shout out. I don't think they are on a particular network. I think they're just kind of just out there on their own doing their own thing. Um, if they are on a network, someone correct me and let me know. Cause yeah, I, f- I forget right now, but um, if you go on Podbean or you go on Spotify, you just search horror returns and you'll be able to find them. Yeah. Yep. Any podcast, ca- uh, podcast app out there, you should be able to find them easily. And we'll provide a link to Spotify and Podbeans, considering those are two free apps that you can use. And you're more than welcome to uh, to follow them on our on our links that we're going to provide for you guys. Yeah. Um, And then yeah, we can uh, move on to the next one. And I'll talk about these gentlemen because they are my Aussie boys. They're they're part of the old British Empire with Canada. Um, Tim Davis and there's another gentleman that I've never been able to get his his full name on there. Um, they run the Horrors for Dummy podcast and and his little promo about it is two guys one mic, and it is hilarious. Um, oh, they are great. They are so funny, and one of my favorite episodes that they did is they talked about um, the the boy too, and they talked about Katie Holmes, and then they went on to talk about Tom Cruise and how he does his own stunts and how much they think he's annoying, and I loved it. It was awesome, um, but very very like, similar views to Scott and I, which is maybe why I like them so much. They also looked at the farm as well, uh, but they do a lot of coverage of 
recently released movies and they get movies differently in Australia. So they even talk about how they will get movies later than America or North America. Uh, they've even talked about coming to America before and what states they would want to go to, which I think is really, really cool. Um, and then they also do themes. They most recently did a metal episode uh, as and well. That episode was games. awesome. Yeah. Like they're honestly, they're, they're fun dudes. They, they give giveaways. They're very good at giving giveaways. And if you go on to Apple reviews, Apple, I, Apple iPod reviews or Apple reviews, um, and you and you write a review for them. There's a very good chance that you can win a prize, and I think that's awesome that they do stuff like that. So, yeah, big shout out to them. And yet again, uh, they're an independent podcast. I don't believe they're part of any network, or at least I haven't been able to see that. But we will provide the links to their Podbean and their Spotify as well. Yep, I'll say, and I yeah, highly recommend these guys. Uh, they are on my weekly rotation, or and uh, I I just love them. Tim Davis and I have been friends for quite some time, and yeah, I'm, I support the hell out of their show. Love those guys. So check it out. Yep, and then I will bring up another uh, one more for tonight. That uh, now these guys are on a network, and I terrible and didn't do my homework to find out which network it was. Sorry, guys, but uh, it is the Double Edged Double Bill podcast. Uh, I've talked about them a few times on these shows. Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani are the hosts. What they do is they have kind of a Russian roulette. Uh, they will do two movies that are similar in theme and they will have each time they kind of rotate who does this part, but one of them will pick two good movies and the other will pick two bad movies. And then at the end of the episode, they will have either their guest or one of themselves play Russian roulette and uh, be like, all right, pick a number between one and 10. And so they'll be like for the good movie, I'll go with number seven and whatever wherever that one that number lands if it's the, whatever movie it's closest to that's the movie they'll watch and it's the same with the bad movie and it's kind of a fun little gimmick they have that i love like i i've been on their show three different times now and i just love just randomly guessing because i know i'm not going to be on the episode the next episode so whatever bad movie i pick i just have a good giggle out of because they, they always sound so defeated when they find out what the bad episode they chose or bad movie is they chose <laughs> they do i've listened to some episodes they do <laughs> and it's just a lot of fun like but yeah they are great reviewers uh they know their shit and they have a lot of fun talking about it and they always bring on interesting guests and yeah i've been friends with adam thomas and met him in person multiple times and heather even got a chance to meet him finally at the astronomicon yeah cool dude badass tattoos and shit too yeah and thomas mariani I, i've also been a good friend of for a while because i followed him when he was on the horror news radio and I've always loved his personality and loved his uh, takes on films, but yeah, definitely give the double edged double bill show uh, a chance. Cause they are just a very good show and they, they aren't specifically horror. They cover pretty much all genres just depends on like if a movie's coming out that month, they're going to compare two movies similar to that. Or if someone passed away, they'll do movies based on that person and things like that. So it's a very interesting and uh, unique show. And I really recommend it. Yeah, and, and we want to, we'll be doing this segment every month, and I think it's, it's, it's important to let other people know what other podcasts are out there, um, and what, what you can listen to your listening pleasure, because there's so many different personalities, and, and different ways that people run their podcasts, and different things work for different people, so we're happy to support our podcasting brothers and sisters um, across the world. Actually, we're, we're also aiming to go outside of the networks that we're familiar with and, and look to people that are maybe independents or other parts of the world that we've never met before. Yeah. And yeah, because there are a lot out there and we'll be having a lot more fun conversations about some of these shows coming up. I'm, I can guarantee it. All right. So the main topic of our show tonight is going to be creature features, nature run amok. We we're going to originally do just creature features in general, but then we realized there are two different huge categories that we could discuss. So we decided to break these down into two separate episodes. So we'll cover just like monster style creature features at a later time. But this one, we are just going to be focusing on natural horror or nature run amok or eco horror, if you will. And what we're going to be, um, and, and we know how, passionate people are about this topic oh and you are um, jerry herring <laughs> <laughs> our our boss at kill the cast jerry herring <laughs> our boss <laughs> our supervisor 
um, CEO of Kill the Cast. Um, but what we, what Scott and I have decided to do is we're we're going to break it into uh, subcategories. So we're going to talk about eco horror this week, which is just natural creature features. So we're looking at just animals, primarily um, or only actually animals that have not been modified. So that's what we're talking about, and we're talking about specific things from the movies. So you know, we may not go into in-depth storylines on some of the movies that people are most passionate about. We're just taking our own personal look at creature features and where we think they've been shaped in society. Um, Scott will be talking about what he thinks makes a good creature feature. And of course, always up for discussion, right? Like this is our opinion and this is what we're sharing, but we're always open to hear what other people think. Yep. And um, we may, and we will be spoiling some of these films just because we'll have to get in the meat of the topic, but there, I don't. So some of the movies that we'll be going over is Orca, Grizzly, uh, The Ghost in the Darkness, um, The Birds, Jaws, and and crawl, the shallows, are the ones I will probably be referring to the most. Is there any ones that you want to add in there, Scott? Um, Day of the Animals. Um, I'll probably briefly talk about the nest and ticks, and a couple other just more like uh, what was the other one? Uh, the killer crocodile. So yeah, there we'll do, I'll have a list written out on uh, our show notes showing what movies we talk about and just give you a heads up that yeah we may spoil something in, in in any of these films yeah so we will be going over certain scenes from this film we're not going to be doing a walkthrough of each of these films um but if you are someone who doesn't like to know about any kind of th things that happen um probably the ones that will be that will be the easiest ones that you like the ones in the 70s obviously i think most people have seen them um but more of the recent ones uh, we'll try not to spoil too much but we will definitely be talking about scenes from crawl in the shallows so when i get there i will announce that again that we're going to be talking about scenes from those two movies because i think they're the most recent like ghost in the darkness was made in like 96 so i'm not thinking that people are you know that's a brand new movie but yet again we will be talking about scenes from them so yep and also 47 meters down and oh yes. 47 meters down uncaged yes we'll be talking about those two as well so thank you scott um anything else you want to say before i dive into the societal impact oh i'll just give it like a like what i like I grew up on these types of movies, like natural horror films. So when we decided to do this topic, I thought this was going to be a lot of fun because, you know, Jaws is like one that everybody knows and most people have probably seen when they were a kid or young teen. So just being able to talk about these, I'm excited just to kind of go over them because natural horror films like this are a unique breed. Absolutely. I I don't know if I really watched a lot of them when I was younger, but I love them. And I love a lot of the like cheesy ones that we won't be talking about today. Like I, I dig me some big blue sea movies where the, where the sharks have been given basically steroids and, <laughs> right. you know, made to be super awesome. And I, I love it when um, animals are given powers and, and able to do mutant things. I always think that's pretty badass. Um, I like a lot of, the, the werewolf movies and stuff like that, as we talked about already earlier, uh, creatures that you don't know what they are from space. I, I dig that stuff too. But I have a real soft spot for eco horror simply because I have a big passion towards wildlife and wildlife conservation. So when I yep, see animals like fighting back, I'm like, fuck yeah, kill those yep. humans. <laughs> so. Nature taking its revenge. Right. Um, one of these movies was actually hard for me to get through and i believe it was also hard for scott to get through yeah um, that, especially the first like the first 20 30 minutes yeah and it's and it's you know at the time it was fine this movie was made in the 70s and i get why they portrayed what they portrayed um but you know watching it in 2020 with with different eyes it was you know for me it was a hard watch and other people may not be affected by that and that's fine but um yeah it definitely was a tough one for me so yeah so yeah so i guess i'll dive right in to talking about creature features. So as we all know, climate change is alive and well, but the concerns of this really picked up in the 1960s. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, Scott, but when I was in high school, we talked a lot about Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and it came out in 1962. And it was seen as the gas root movement of environmental um, concern. So she talked about the harm of chemical pesticides that were being used by US farming, farming um, commercial farming at the time in U.S. farming, and companies got very mad at her. 
A lot of CEOs were not happy with this book. They tried to make her look like she was crazy, but she had backed up a lot of this with facts. So it was like a coming of age of here was this literature being written of, you know, what we're doing is we're poisoning our water systems and we're going to cause issues down the road. So it would only make sense that movies reflect society, right? We, yep. we talked about this in our slasher episode that when something is going on, we, we tend to respond to it with media. Uh, as we can see with the virus COVID right now, there's probably going to be a movie about this in like 10 years. Oh, for sure. And it's going to be based upon toilet paper or whatever else they decide to bring up. <laughs> so anyway, uh, one of the movies, one of the articles that Scott found actually talks about eco-horror, horror, special cluster, living in fear, living in dread, pretty soon we'll all be dead. What a nice little rhyme. Yeah, and this I like is that title. The, uh, interdisciplinary studies in literature and the environment from 2014, written by Mr. Stephen Russ and Carter Souls. So within their, argu- their article, they talked about ecological horror. So yet again, we're focusing just on natural creatures here. And the dangers of ecological environments and representing an ecological crisis or the blur between between human and non-human discretion. And a lot of the movies that we will be bringing up today talks about how animals are be almost taking out revenge. Like in Grizzly, in the Grizzly movie, it's a it's an believed as an ancient sized great grizzly that has somehow survived the test of time through bloodline or whatever that is taking revenge on humans. Yep. Um, same with Orca. We see this very similarly. Same with the birds, you could argue Alfred Hitchcock's a bird. So Eco-horror has been around since the early 60s and has been a term that has been used going into the 90s. So the article argues that the reasons the reason that humans love these stories that have to do with nature is because it's the ego of control. It can be seen as something that we have no control over, but we eventually do. So think of Jaws, okay? So spoiler, if you haven't seen Jaws. Uh, Jaws basically kicks everybody's ass yeah. uh, for a majority of the movie. And pretty takes much puts boat. a town and uh, pretty much quarantines a whole entire town <laughs> right uh takes down some boats takes down some people like it's a pretty um aggressive shark and finally at the end we gain control over it so you know it it talks about how we we, un- we don't understand nature and how it overpowers us overpowers us and then somehow towards the end we're able to control it and own it and and be able to put it back in its place basically so thinking of the death of jaws the bear from grizzly um, and now I know the alligator from the movie Alligator was grew to the size of it being in the sewer, which isn't too far fetched. Animals no. do grow, especially reptiles, to the size yeah. of wherever they're kept. Um, and the idea is that they're uncontrollable until we're eventually able to control them. So that was the point of this article, and I think that's fairly true. Would you agree, Scott, with some of the creature features that we've seen? Oh yeah, definitely. Like there are so many of these types of films like that focus on that specifically, where it's just a pretty much a natural disaster if you will like a one of these creatures and then yeah like the by the end yeah we have gained back control of nature and pretty much uh yeah like you said it's kind of like an ego boost for us humans well and that's what this article talks about and it's ironic right because they were here before us yeah you know or before the form that we have depending on what your scientific religious beliefs are but you know i think it's really really interesting that it's always us beating up nature and we look at like reptiles for example they have been around much longer than we have oh yeah and they will probably be around much longer than we will be um if we don't harm them because really and this is going to be a such a national geographic moment the scariest creature on this planet is human beings but uh, yeah this is very true but i will not go on too much of my political soapbox here and i will move on with the plot of the of the creature features so they talk about the birds in this article and the birds in 1963 is cited as one of the major examples of referring to human influence on the environment and the problems that can be caused by um humans so a further article talked about this. So there was an article by Megan Burick's comparison and film adaptation of the birds in the Hunger Games. It was clear to her that the birds was about Cold War or environmental influences. But it was also a movie that was really trying to bring out the state of the, the environmental state that what was occurring at the time. And we can probably look back to Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, as a birth of this as a birth of people questioning now what are we doing to the environment and at what point is the environment going to fight back 
So then we lead to other movies in the 60s. So we have Grizzly, 17, um, 17, yeah, 1700s, yeah. <laughs> uh, 1976, an angry ancient bear. So they, they argue that, well, Grizzlies could never be this big. Well, yes, the, the bear and Grizzly is, is, is very big. But for somebody who lives in the north and has gone to see black bears in person, black bears can get very big. And they are much smaller than Grizzlies. So yeah, Grizzly is the largest of the bear species. Like, Grizzlies can, I, I've been to the Toronto Metro Zoo, which I, have issues with Sue's too, but this Sue I'm a little more okay with because of the space that animals have there and how they're treated. Um, I do my research before I go to Sue's, but anyway. Yeah, same here. Um, you know, the grizzly there is pretty big. Like, he's a, he's a big boy. Um, so I can imagine that having a very, very large grizzly would not be out of the realm of possibility. Uh, the idea is that it's an ancient bear. And at one time, these bears, you know, had a genocide. They killed a whole bunch of, they refer to them as Native Americans. I don't know what the correct version is now for, um, in the United States, we call to, we refer to um, indigenous people in Canada. I'm not sure what the correct term is in the United States. So forgive me if I'm not using the correct term. Yep, that's pretty, yeah, that's pretty much what we use as Native American or indigenous. Indigenous, okay. Um, so, it, you know, and now it's come back and it's no longer hunting for food it's hunting out of pleasure it's how to, hunting out of anger it's hunting to, with the purpose of causing harm and killing um anything you want to add to that scott because i know you saw this movie as well uh no that is pretty accurate um yeah this is uh like like we were saying like yeah this is a large large grizzly it's 18 feet from the description i was reading and but it's still plausible it's not like out of the realm of possibility and they it doesn't have any supernatural powers it's just pure natural force and a bear of that size like i've been up in close and personal with bears in the wild like they they will fuck you up for lack of better words like yeah you know i've um been up in northern ontario quite a bit and run into black bears um one time i ran into a cub that was quite frightening because wherever baby bear is mama ain't far away um and mama don't play so no. you know bears are definitely very very strong animals and they can take a lot they've been all around a long time so i thought that this movie was was very good it talked about her and you know even in this movie they had hunters they had you know they're trying to get to control of this bear problem of this one oversized grizzly that's causing all these problems and how they're like oh grizzlies can't be in this parts because you know it's only brown bears or black bears you know grizzlies are no longer in this area and they realize that the grizzly is still there and they bring in these hunters and there's this conflict between the head park ranger and the corporate of like you know the hunters coming in and what's that going to do the environment the hunters are going to kill other bears so even in the 70s we were seeing this push to environmental conservation um so it's not something that's new in 2020 like this is something that has been going on for years is that we've realized that we've done a pretty good job of you know brutalizing the environment and that we need to do something and in this case the bear fights back yeah. And also Days of the Animals. So this movie right at the beginning talks about if we do not change our path, this is what could happen. Yeah. You know, and it has a full written thing that says that. Yeah, and it's pretty much talking about like destroying of the ozone layer, which makes these animals with the UV rays not having the protection of the ozone layer, the UV rays start making these animals highly aggressive and it's not just certain animal, it's all animals. Mm -hmm. And even starts affecting even some of the humans. Yep. It, it talks about, you know, we talked about UV levels for years. And, and this in 1977, following up from probably the success of Grizzly, and the idea of the environment, the, and the animals fighting back. The animals are saying, we've had enough of you mistreating our environment. This is us responding back to you. Speaking of animals. Oh, he's getting aggressive because of the ozone layer. He's, he's, he's got his own opinion. He's got his own opinion on the matter. So Orca is the next movie that I want to talk about. And Orca was a very, very difficult movie for me to sit through. Yeah, same um, here. I have seen the documentary Black Fish, and I don't believe you have seen it, Scott. Have you? No, I have not. You have told me enough to pretty much make me want to stay away from it. Yeah, I don't recommend it. You know, if you're already someone who goes, gee, maybe we shouldn't have killer wills and cap captivity captivity and maybe we shouldn't have things like sea world or marine land for those of us that live in ontario then you probably don't need to watch it um 
if you are somebody who thinks that's okay, I may suggest that you watch it. It may change your opinion a little bit on it. Um, but Orca is, again, it's about a killer whale that takes revenge. Its mate is is killed, is butchered, um, along with uh, the child that is inside of the whale or oh, the baby. So that I, scene I should was... say child, baby whale. Um, that scene was so tough. Very difficult. And, and you know, back in the 70s, and yet again, this is me getting on my political high horse, people used to capture whales. That's how SeaWorld and Marine Land got their whales. Yeah. Like, you know, and I, anyway, so I think that this movie was very capturing of what was going on at the time and the attitude at that time. Um, so anyway, the whale becomes angry of course, and stalks this, the fisherman that is responsible and looks for revenge. It's filmed in beautiful Newfoundland, which is just, it's one of our provinces. And um, I'm pretty sure there's some Canadian actors in it because I hear the Newfoundland accent a lot throughout it. And it's in this beautiful little fishing town. So the scenery is, is breathtaking. And the whale basically <laughs> causes major havoc. There's one point where the will starts a fire, which I thought was pretty interesting how yeah, they had that will awesome. starting the fire. Um, so obviously it takes liberties with what killer wills would be able to do. But killer wills are intelligent creatures. Yep. And, um, sorry, go ahead, Scott. I was going to say, I wanted to give a shout out to Phil Ray from our podcast page. He told me we were talking about this film last night because it's one of his films that traumatized him as a kid. and he brought up that this was based off of a novel. Oh, really? I did not know that. Yeah, and a lot of people will say that this is a Jaws ripoff, but the author of the novel that came out with the book before Jaws came out. And I don't think they're comparable. Like, whales and sharks are, first of all, different creatures. Um, different, different breeding habits. Like, whales are pack animals they live in a pack they live in a family that is accurate yeah i don't know if they mate for life um i believe they do i, I be, like that's something they talked about in the film but they are very highly intelligent not that sharks are not sharks are very intelligent as well too but they tend to be solo predators um and they're fish whales are are man they, they breathe they need air holes they come up for air so like not to go into like oh yet again this is not a national discovery or <laughs> geographical uh podcast but they're but at they the are same time it's relevant yeah, there are different animals. I don't think, and I don't think the two plots are the same. Like one is taking place in the ocean where, you know, we see the harm happen. In, in Jaws, you never really see why the shark is pissed off. The shark's just there causing chaos and he's just there. You know, he's probably doing what sharks do, right? Yeah, because I've never seen the comparison between the two either after watching Orca. I didn't no, see it. No, besides the fact that they're, they live in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't get how, you know, and like, and their and their creature features are natural eco creature features, as we should say. But anyway, that film shows the the anger of this animal coming back, and the idea that it can feel emotions, it can feel grief, it can feel um, revenge. And it talks about with the main character, whose wife had passed away in a car accident. She was hit by a drunk driver with. And she was with child and the child passed away as well. And, you know, there was also this relationship between him and the whale. He's like, I'm the drunk driver for the whale. And they kind of refer to him as him throughout it. So, and I thought the special effects in it, and you'll get to that more later. I thought they were pretty good for, you know, 1977. Um, oh, yeah. Now, mind you, this was before animals had a lot of rights. So I kind of wonder how animals were used in these movies and if it was ethical. But, yeah. you know, it was the 70s and you kind of just take it as it is. Exactly. And yeah, this one is a good way of showing of the like overfishing and overhunting type situation. Yeah, which is still relevant today, which we, you know, are still trying to battle with. So that gets to alligator. And I know this is Jerry Herring's favorite, or one of his favorite creature features. I should say favorite because I do believe Jaws is, Jaws is his favorite. Yep, and um, same with I Orca. Really and I think he really likes, oh, does he like Orca as well? Yeah, that, he's the one that recommended Orca for us. Excellent. Um, so alligator, so a pet alligator is flushed down the toilet, it grows to its environment, and then it comes out with a hunger. And I love the scene in alligator when it shows up at the rich people's party and it just starts oh, yeah. eating everything. I just think that scene is amazing. And this is one of those movies that I seen when I was a kid. So that's what, this is what made me love eco horror movies or animal run amok films. Cause... And what was it about this movie that you, that you connected with Scott when it came to the eco piece of it? Um, with this one with the eco piece, I really, uh, 
I th- I'm not sure, like, uh, I'm because it's been a long time since I've watched this movie. A very, very long time. So I'm trying to go back in my brain, but I don't think there was much of an eco piece to this one just because it was, it kind of just grew to its environment and lived and it was just coming out because it was hungry. Well, I think the eco piece would be flushing the, the animal down the toilet. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I do think this is a common thing. I've known people that have flushed their lizards that they no longer want down the toilet. Um, that is very true. Which yeah. I think is the most unhumane thing you can do. Yeah. You know, give the lizard to somebody else. Don't drown it. But I think that this spoke to how a lot of people would deal with pets that they didn't want anymore and how they still do. We still have issues with pet abandonment and stuff like that that occurs. And this is basically an abandoned pet that grew to its environment and was pissed and needed to eat more. It ate whatever it could in the sewer and then it needed more and it needed more demand, which you could also turn into consumerism if we look at people right now in the way that we need more and more and more as things go on. Now, at least this is an animal, so it actually needed it to eat and survive. Right, especially because it grew so big, it needed to eat a lot more. Exactly, right? And the scenes in it are just just awesome, you know? And I think that, you know, they don't go into great detail the dangers of flushing your pet down the toilet and how that's wrong and anything like that. So I'm not trying to say that that's what this movie is all about. But when I look at the eco piece of it, that's what it pulls us out for me. Um, and then all of a sudden you have this alligator, which alligators are fast on land. They swim fast. They are also smart. And they have killer jaws. And they do things called death rolls, where yep. once they get you in there, they just rotate you and rotate you. They are a fascinating creature. And I think as humans, when we go out back to that ego piece, they know how to survive. Alligators have been around a very, very long time and they know how to survive. And I think there's a lot for humans when it comes to us fighting back against them or being able to catch them. It really is a feat because they are not an easy creature to deal with. No, Um, they are not. Even just by their design. So I thought that was a very interesting movie that came out at the time. So we have these movies all coming out within four years of each other. And then of course we have Jaws. Now, you know, Jaws is a incredible movie, and I'm not sure if you're going to talk about it more in your section um, in terms of creature development. Oh, I'll, be, I'll bring that one up because Jaws is the granddaddy of nature, run amok, eco-horror. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of the basis, and it's, you know, it's renowned. There was a ride in Universal Studios for years that were based on the Jaws um, movie. Yeah. And, and I'm and so pissed before. that they tore it down before I ever get to go to Universal. Aww. Well, you never know. Who knows? It might come back again. They might that would be nice. remake Jaws, which would make all every horror fan angry. Shit themselves. But, <laughs> you know, but if it brings back the ride and we get more Jaws stuff, then I guess that's not a horrible thing. But I thought what was interesting about Jaws, so yet again, I'm, a very, I'm very into nature, is that Jaws, credible film. But I wondered what was the effect that it had on people's visions of sharks? So the original... This is based off a storyline of a rogue great white shark that attacks swimmers on the New Jersey shoreline nearby a creek during the summer of 1916. Now, I had understood that it was a bull shark, not a white shark. So perhaps Mr. Herring, if he's listening, can correct on that. Um, that oh, original, like the real story? Yeah, but the original story is based off of because I do believe bull sharks are the sharks that can swim in fresh water and... Um, salt water but i may have that name wrong but so this was based on a story and even though this movie was great and awesome it all of a sudden created this fear of sharks yeah and that has some very very dangerous consequences so all of a sudden we started to have dozens of shark fishing tournaments pop up a collective testosterone rush certain sweeping through the e- through the east coast of the u.s so basically what we're looking at is after jaws was created we started to see a push of people wanting to kill sharks that there was this belief that if we didn't kill sharks, Jaws was going to happen. Now, for anyone who is basically familiar with the concept of sharks, they understand the sharks are not looking to eat humans. Yeah. They are looking to eat fish. So when they bite a human and they get to bone, typically they will not continue. I know this because I watch Shark Week, which also <laughs> started in 1988. So Shark Week has been around since July 17th, 1988. Which I did not know. I thought... That I was thought it was more a new of a thing. newer. Yeah, I thought it was newer. Right? So what we are really seeing also from the development of these creature features is a push of fear, 
but then also the demand for education. So we started after Jaws, we started to see this push for shark fishing tournaments and people wanting to kill sharks and being afraid of sharks and this, you know, increased fear. But what that also led to was the push for knowledge, which was Discovery Channel coming up with Shark Week. So with, with the, even the challenges of the ecosystem or us trying to educate people about the education, the ecosystem with having these movies, we also then led to the frustration of people not liking or caring for these creatures, but then that led to the education. So then as we move into the 90s, we start to get a impact of fear and con comedy in um, creature features. So think of arachnophobia and anaconda. So both of them respectively talk about probably the two animals that people are the most afraid of spiders yep. and snakes do you have a fear of either one of these um not really um i've told you before that you know i any spider i see in my house i make a deal with and just i consider them my roommates and i have a huge respect for especially spiders and uh, i have a huge fascination with them as well um though when i was younger I was kind of uh, terrified by spiders, especially the bigger ones or like the venomous ones. So this movie truly had a large impact on me because mm. I seen this one in theaters and yeah, it, it left me with nightmares where I'm checking my bed, checking everything before I'd go to bed, like anywhere, like any nook and cranny, I was making sure there was no spiders that could come down on me when I was a kid. And I probably, this movie probably did that for a lot of people, right? Yeah. And I think what's interesting about this is it exaggerates animal behavior. Very much yep. so. Um, the speed they move, how, how difficult they are to kill, the conditions that they can survive in. So if we look at anaconda and arachnophobia and we really begin to cycle down what these, what these creatures were. So these creatures are presented as normal creatures. So this is a normal anaconda, and this is a normal spiders. Yes, they're poisonous spiders, but they're seen as, as regular spiders. So a year ago, I went to this educational, I guess you could say, workshop seminar about spiders and snakes, because I have a big fascination with them. Yep. I also work at the University of Guelph, which we are the largest animal-based university research hub in Canada. We also have the vet school with our... With our um, our university as well. And we had specialists there that talked about spiders and snakes. And first off, spiders are very, very sensitive to falls. So we were able to see a tarantula up live and personal, but people were not allowed to hold the, trans the, tran the tran tarantula. Like they would have to, if you were allowed to hold it, you would have to cup your hands and they would have to be right underneath you. Because even if that spider fell a couple of centimeters, it could die. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. So it's, and very, very sensitive to, to temperature. So we could only have it out for a couple of minutes because it needed to go back into its controlled environment of heat for it to survive. Yep. So when we look at movies like arachnophobia and we look at these poisonous spires coming from these climates and surviving that journey, yes, it can happen. We all hear the stories of, oh, I was at Walmart and I bought some pears and I bought some food and I, there was a spider in it. But it is not as common as people like to think it is. And of course, these movies, we need to exaggerate things, right? We need to exaggerate the fear. We need to push things further. So that's a little bit about spiders. Now about snakes. So in the movie Anaconda, that snake is on speed. <laughs> yes, it, it is. Very, very quickly. But if you go to any exhibits about snakes... You know that the bigger the snake, the slower it moves. Yep. And there are many cases with anacondas in the wild where you can step on them. And they will take forever because they're so long to turn around and see who's there. Now, yes, they can definitely take down children and cattle and all that kind of stuff too. But they don't move at the speed and the pace that is, that is displayed in anaconda, especially with that ladder scene where they're climbing oh. up the ladder and the snake wraps around. That's not actually a thing. Right. 
Right. Now, anacondas are very slow moving, deliberate creatures. Right. So what we've done with these two movies, though, is we've created a exaggeration of their natural behavior. Which we've done with all these eco fix flicks. We've taken a, a creature and we've exaggerated what they could do in their natural state, depending where they are. Now, I know that there are cases where people have gotten bitten by poisonous snakes, and there's king cobras, and there's poisonous snakes in different areas of the world. You know, I feel like Australia is just full of poisonous creatures, but people continue to live in Australia and survive. Yeah. So obviously, you know, and there, there's something to be said about people using these movies as their base of knowledge. And we can all shake our heads and go, oh, no, I don't do that. I don't, I don't use that as my base of knowledge. Well, then watch, watch Jaws and go swimming in the ocean and tell me that you're not a little bit afraid. Right. Right. Like that one, especially that movie. <laughs> that movie, like especially for younger audiences when that first came out, people were terrified of open water. Exactly. Because it, re it, it reflects your fears, right? It's a fear of what we can't control and what we don't know. So moving to the final thing that we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about anyway, for serious creature features current day. So we've kind of, we're skipping over the whole Sharknado and all that other stuff there. <laughs> I, I didn't talk about Lake Placid either here, but that's also very similar to Alligator and the Ghost in the Darkness as well, which is about two man-eating lions. And even then that story has been exaggerated. When I actually looked up the ghosts in the darkness which is based on two man-eating lions that were in africa during the 1800s it was really hard to find how many people they actually killed like right. there was reports that went from 15 to 85 like it was all over the place but it's not surprising that these lions acted territorial and were probably pissed off that these people were there and we're seeing them as bait as food because lions can take down a human and can eat them that is yeah. something that does happen um but to the extent we'll never really know right there's this is a storytelling thing it happened in the 1800s it's not like there was video camera evidence to see how many, how many people were actually killed or, or logs were kept that well especially since many of these workers were from um i don't can't remember which country that they were in but they probably weren't given the same rights they were being you know governed by the british authorities and i don't think they were too overly concerned with the natives that were working on the railroad and keeping accurate track of who survived and who didn't so we'll right. probably never fully know um to the extent of it but that's what we were seeing in the 90s and then we get a little bit silly so we're going to skip over that stage and yeah, we're well, gonna, i'll bring that up later you'll bring that up later um but then we get to serious creature features of current day so we kind of go back to um what are what are we doing now so this is where there may be some spoilers so i'm going to be talking about crawl i'm going to be talking about the shallows and i'm going to be talking about 47 meters down the second one uncaged i have not seen the first one so um what do all these movies do they they yet again talk about humans ability to survive and i believe you brought up a really good point scott when you said that crawl could be reflective of climate change yeah, because that was a wild hurricane that brought in these alligators. And, like, I just have a feeling that that's, like, a underlining theme with that film is that, you know, the climate changes get, like, we're not doing much about it, so weather's getting crazier. Mm -hmm. And things like this could happen to the extent that it did in the movie. Maybe not so much, but... You know, there is things like this that could, it is a possibility. Absolutely. And I, and I think, yeah, like, you know, the nature is go, getting uh, a little more out of control and that's because we're not, you know, taking precautions like we should. Absolutely. And I think that her ability, so they, they set up the, the protagonist very well in this the main character they have her being able to swim they show her as a swimmer so that's why she's able to handle herself in the water she goes back to save her father during this hurricane and that's where she discovers that he has been injured and that there are these um, alligators that are I would say fairly big and that probably is regular size for alligators that live up in the wild I have watched that show on A&E like where they go out and catch the alligators and stuff in the swamp mm -hmm. i can't remember the name of it now swamp country or something like that anyway something like that yeah yeah the alligators range of different sizes right so i wouldn't be any i wouldn't be shocked that there couldn't be alligators this big and basically her trying to outsmart them and now the human environment which was the house has become the alligator env environment right because they can swim faster they can run faster in short distances um 
they can do all those things that that humans can't do so it's really this protagonist against the alligator and there's lots of scenes where they're you know trying to different ways to outsmart the alligator and get out of this situation and it's a very very well done movie and i think it takes itself very seriously as a creature feature which is nice to see um yep. suspenseful you can feel the rain and the dampness in this movie oh like, yeah you really can and i think that's great um and then the shallows with miss blake lively um came out i think in 2016 she's a surfer uh, she goes out surfing, beautiful waves, beautiful atmosphere, and she goes out for one last time when she probably shouldn't have, and she falls off her board, and a shark shows up, and there's a dead whale that the shark is eating at, and she thinks that the shark is worried that she is coming on its territory, so here the shark is eating this dead whale, and it thinks that she is there to go after the whale as well and the shark becomes very aggressive with her now i am not an expert on shark behavior but from what i've watched from shark week i've never heard of a shark stalking someone for as long as his shark it stalks big lively in this movie right um she basically takes shelter on a rock and then also a buoy and she's constantly trying to avoid dehydration starvation um heat stroke and trying to and hypothermia like everything she tries to survive i think it's in about a 24 to 48 hour process against this shark um and the shark is relentless relentless so yet again i don't know enough about sharks to know how accurate that is perhaps we can have some viewers talk about in the comments um from what i've watched on shark Creek, there's nothing to that i've seen that has ever said that that's how sharks would behave but it's a very very serious movie um it shows sharks as smart creatures very very smart particularly this one shark and of course she does outsmart the shark at the end um of course. as all protagonists do and it's a little you know, she's kind of able to, I want, I don't want to say fully outswim, but outsmart. And she does survive. So that is a spoiler. She does make it. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting film. So if you want to see the development of the shark creature as of now and shark versus man I, or woman in this case, it's a very, very interesting film. I think it's a very predictable film, to be honest with you. I don't think anyone will walk into this film and not know what's going to happen. It's not like open water. And I love the open water movies. And the first one, I really didn't know how that was going to happen. Now, mind you, I didn't know that it was based off a true story when I first saw open water. Um, and I've never seen any of those movies. Like they are on my list of things to watch at some point. Well, it's a very interesting story. It's, it's, it's based on a story of, or loosely based probably on a true story of a couple that was out um, scuba diving, snorkeling in Australia and the boat leaves without them and they're stuck in the ocean and they're trying to combat yet again, hypothermia, dehydration and sharks, which I would actually argue that dehydration and hypothermia will probably kill you first before the sharks would. Yep. Um, but it's a very, very interesting film. And then finally, we have 47 Meters Down Uncaged. So what I really liked about this movie, and Scott, have you seen it? I did. I actually just watched it this week. And what did you think? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, it is actually pretty damn believable, like with the, uh, the blind sharks that, are, that have adapted to like, the dark underwater in the temple that they give, end, up, end up discovering. And yeah, I thought this built a lot of tension. And like, yeah, there was some unbelievable so stuff, but like the fact that the sharks were kind of hunting by vibration, almost like, almost kind of like bats in a way, was very uh, a fascinating take and just showing how, you know, nature can adapt. And, and that's exactly what I was going to say. You actually took the words right out. It was a oh. great film on nature's ability to adapt. And it's not far off from human ability, right? Because if we lose one of our senses and other senses are heightened. Exactly. Right. So I really liked this film because of this. And I think the setup was fairly reasonable. These young ladies go out there. They do some cave diving. One of them has a little bit of experience, so they think they're going to be fine. And this is a, a community that is near the ocean. So one would assume these individuals have gone out snorkel lot diving and scuba diving before i actually have a friend that does a lot of cave diving and he'll go out to florida and he'll do cave diving there so it is a very common practice that if you are somewhere where you live near oceans that you could engage in this and become fairly confident with it so and the sharks in it i thought were 
ideal. So this is, this is yet again, nature being able to adapt and overcome the environment that it's in. And what I thought was interesting about these three movies is that I didn't get the sense that the shark or the alligators were hunting out of revenge. If anything, they were hunting either out of territory or for food. Yep. Um, and I think that that takes it back to realistically what um, animals would be doing in that environment. But we have moved away from the 70s straight out message of if we don't stop what we're doing to the environment, animals are going to get pissed and they're going to come back at us. So I wonder if we should go back to that, especially with people not always believing in climate change and thinking that it's made up that maybe we do need to, you know, go back to that kind of flavor, but we have done that with movies like deep impact and stuff like that. And people still aren't fully buying into it, but I think it's an interesting transition. When I looked at societal's reaction to horror where we were in the seventies and the sixties and where we are now, it's almost like we're engaging more realistic behaviors from animals and there's less of the animal wanting to get revenge. It's just the animal doing what the animal would naturally do and us trying to survive that outcome. Yeah. And I noticed that a lot of this is now we are in their territory in these movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where before it was more like, oh, they are coming to us to get their revenge. Now it's like, nope, we have just happened to be in their territory and we're food to them. Absolutely, right? I'll let you take over. All right. So what I am going to be talking about is more of what makes a creature feature good, bad, and where they are uh, possibly heading or where they have pretty much headed. Um, The first thing I want to bring up, though, because this is going to be all opinion-based for me on like what I think makes a good natural creature run amok horror film or eco-horror. Um. So what I wanted to bring up first is the themes. As you see with a lot of these, a lot of these films, uh, certain one of these are based off true events. Yeah, they're exaggerated or can be fairly truthful, but to me, some of those make really good horror film or horror films like this, like uh, Jaws, um, Backcountry, like you were telling me about. While exaggerated, they give you a decent uh, theme or a story. Um, another one that you had brought up and like was like the main topic was like the envi- environmental dangers of us destroying the earth, like waste disposal, radiation, overhunting. Uh, what I had brought up about climate change. These factors are what, in these films, are what make the animal aggressive. And to me, I feel that that makes for a good film because it gives a pretty good reason to why they are being aggressive. Like, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I, and I have a couple examples, like we were saying, like Backcountry, uh, Jaws. So, like, this is pretty much a list of them, but, like, yeah, Orca for the revenge, um, for overhunting. Grizzly is for overhunting. Killer Crocodile is more about waste disposal and how we would just dump something into the water just to get rid of it. And while... Killer Crocodile may not be like a legit uh, realistic style one. It is just like an overgrown crocodile and like it, but it is uh, kind of a good, I good take on like what would be considered like, you know, learning how to dispose of things properly instead of just dumping it into the na- into nature. Uh, Day of the animals with the depleting depletion of the ozone layer and causing these animals to become aggressive and attack. Um, but another thing I think that makes for a good movie is the story has to be, for me, has to be somewhat believable, like the types of animals that are attacking and their reason for attacking. So obviously we already covered what the reasons for attacking that I think would be fitting, but some good examples of this would be like, obviously Jaws, Alligator, Ghost in the Darkness, Arachnophobia. These are animals that could hurt you, are, could be believable in killing you and like you know killing humans in general uh bad examples would be night of the lepus <laughs> killer rabbits okay i i can't get behind movies like this they have like rabbits that are going to be killing us really there's 
nothing like there's nothing to be scared of about a rabbit. Well, rabbits are vegetarians. Yeah, and so I think that would was... involve mutation, right? That's not a natural creature reaction. Yeah, exactly. And a lot, a lot of these like bad examples are pretty much like that. Um, the nest, which is based on roaches that are killing people. Roaches are survival survivalists, but they're not. They won't kill humans. Well, a boring roach movie would be the disease that they carried and watching someone get sick over a number of years. (laughs) Exactly. But no, these things were like, these ones were like burrowing inside of people and explode, creating a nest inside their stomachs and bursting out and stuff like that. Yeah. Probably not something roaches are going to do anytime soon. Yeah, exactly. And the same thing kind of like with ticks. Ticks will kill you because of their disease, like Lyme disease and all yeah. that stuff. But Can you imagine a horror movie based on Lyme disease? It'd be the, oh, it'd <laughs> be the worst. Boring movie ever. It'd be painful to watch someone die of Lyme disease. Mind you, it's a pretty serious disease. Yeah, I, um, I have a couple family yeah. members that have dealt with it. So yeah, I it's under- not easy to deal with. <laughs> yeah, so I have a uh, always. I'm always precautious when it comes to walking in the wilderness around like places where ticks can be bad. Because just because I've dealt with that personally, but ticks in this movie are once again radiated and aggressive and are like burrowing under people's skin to kill them no point that, that, that that's not scary to me it's silly and just like at, for a while there people were trying to just like come up with and making pretty much any animal a threat and i think that country really plays into that area so backcountry is a movie um so there will be a spoiler here if you have not seen backcountry it's a 2014 film it's based on a story that happened in southern ontario so about two hours three hours north of me is where the story occurred it's based on a um a couple that went out and did some backpacking and were attacked by a bear now in this movie the bear is a grizzly bear uh we do not have grizzly bears in Southern Ontario. Unfortunately, we only have black bears, which are just as scary. You know, I would not want to oh, yeah. mess with a black bear, but they are considerably less big than the the bear that is portrayed in black back country. But um, the the scenery of black back country and the reason why the bear attacks is very much this natural. You know, you're in the bear's territory and the bear doesn't know who you are and you go off the beaten path. And this happens all the time with people. Um, our Canadian brother out in, in out in BC moves. I'm probably here probably hears all the time of people getting attacked by mountain lions when they go off the beaten path and grizzlies. Stop going off the beaten path. Yeah, Don't... stop entering other animal <laughs> territory and freaking out like right. blaming the animal. Bring bear spray. Bring a gun if you need to. Like whatever you need to do to survive that area if you get attacked. But at the same time, it's their territory. They were there first, and you know I'm not encouraging going and shooting animals by any stance of the imagination. I've just encouraged common sense. But back country is very much a, you know, a realistic story of why a bear would attack. Um, it's it's territorial based, and what the damage a bear attack can do. I think that that's really important as well. That wasn't really displayed in Grizzly. Grizzly was not a realistic no <laughs> portrayal of a bear attack, but backcountry certainly is. Um, the damage that a bear can do, the power of their claws, the power of their jaws, how strong they are, how quick they can run, how quick they can climb. Um, they're they're very very. I. Uh, uh, what was I going to say? Um, multi mm, averse animals. They can survive a lot of different climates. So um, definitely, I think that's a, a realistic, yet again, more of a realistic horror movie, right? It's animals yeah. just doing what animals do. And that seems to be what we're seeing now in current day. Exactly. And yeah, like, but yeah, especially back in the 80s, there was a lot of those bad animal movies where it's just like killer shrews and things like that, like rats. Like, it's a lot of fear about the creatures that bring disease but that's not what they're focused on they're focused on them being aggressive and actually like killing somebody and that's Mm -hmm. to me they they can be dumb fun movies like i'd watch most of these movies just for the hell of it but i wouldn't consider them good no and uh but another thing i always think when it comes to these horror films is we need a diverse cast of characters that are believable ones that you can care about relate to or even ones that you hate Mm -hmm. but like just make it a diverse cast like i'll put you as the example of uh day of the animals you absolutely can't stand leslie nielsen's character in that he is a complete and utter asshole and he's reacting horribly to the situation that at hand 
and becomes more and more aggressive, which could be due to the radiation of the sun rays or the UV rays. But um, also, in the, like, but yeah, just like you want characters that you can root for, just like in any horror film. Mm-hmm. Like, sure, there's going to be some cannon fodder that's just going to be food for the beast in a way. But there, you should always at least have a couple characters that you can relate to or believe in. And it's like same with uh, 47 Meters Down, the original, the first one. Mm-hmm. Like that one is pretty much a movie about two women stuck at the very bottom of the ocean. And you believe in their characters. They are relatable and you want them to get out of this situation. Um, however, yeah, you have like the bad, like, now, well, now this is where I'll get into the ones from, like, the early 2000 sci-fi movie channel style natural horror films like Sharknado and the like. Because a lot of those characters are, they know they're, the actors know they're in a bad movie. So they play it as they know they're in a bad movie. And I just can't stand those types of characters. Like, I have no connection with them. I can't relate to them in any way. In fact, I just want to see them get killed off. And like I, that was a seemed to be a trend for quite a while. I'm sure there's some of those like made for sci-fi style movies that I haven't seen because I, I didn't like a lot of them, so I never watched a lot of them. But I'm sure there's some out there that had some good character development and some unique characters. But a lot of those characters were just not really that good and were pretty bad actors. Um, and characters like I also want to see these characters take the threat seriously while incorporating decent acting. I mean, not like I want to see, like I was kind of saying, not, I don't want to see characters that know they're in a B movie. I want to see characters that like see this as a real th- threat to make this believable. And I feel like they did that in the early 80s and 70s. Like Piranha yeah. is believable. They're acting yeah. in that. Now Piranha, those Piranhas are um, modified by humans, which is why we I didn't use that as an example in this um, this episode because there is some human intervention when it comes right. to modification of the product. Though the remake didn't wasn't modified. Those were prehistoric no, ones. So that true. one could fit into our category. That one here. could fit into the category. But the idea of um oh my gosh, now I can't remember where we were going with this. But the character, sorry, taking it seriously. Like even that original piranha, even in like Jaws, definitely the acting in Jaws was very, very good. Yeah. Like you believe that they were concerned about this shark. Yeah. Absolutely. Or or like the mayor in Jaws, not concerned at all about the shark yes. and wanting to keep the beach open, not yes, believing it. Yes, absolutely. Um, and the same in Grizzly, right? Wanting to keep people going into the parks. Orca, I didn't feel like the acting was as good. I do think the, no. the main actor was quite good. I think you did find him a, a protagonist and antagonist all at the same time. Like I kind of wanted to see what him get what was coming to him even after he had lost from the whale, the whale had taken people from him. I still was like, yeah, I hope you die. But right. that could have just been my anger towards the whole fishing industry in general. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't think that is what the film was trying to present. And I, yet again, I think that's a really valid point. Sometimes when we watch these movies, we go by what our own personal reaction is. And that's fine. Like That's my own personal reaction. That doesn't mean that's what the movie was going for. Right. and that, But that is also a good example of that character took the threat seriously when he realized that that whale was pretty much yeah. had his eyes sight eyes on him. Yeah. And yeah, like I like, I love those types of movies like where, yeah, the threat is real and it's believable when the characters believe that as well. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Uh, and another one that I like to bring up special, this is a uh, more for the seventies and eighties and nineties. Um, two thousands is a different part, but I'll get to that as well. But the use of real animals or animatronics. Like I love like especially in Day of the Animals, there was a lot of real life animals in that and here a little spoiler for this film. I it looked to me as though uh when there was a cougar attack at the tents, uh it looked like these people were actually getting mauled by cougars. So they, I'm guessing it must've been professional stuntmen or animal people that know how to deal with the animals and know how to handle it. But like, it looked like these animals like literally jumped on the humans and were tearing them apart, which made that even more of a tense uh, scenario. 
And, you know, then there's like uh, an example for the animatronics. Once again, we'll go back to the granddaddy of them all. Jaws. That was Bruce the Shark, which was, you know, completely uh, animatronic built. Unfortunately for that movie, they had a lot of issues getting it to work properly. But then this comes into what I was going to talk about with this is they did it smartly. They realized they had an issue. So what they did is they didn't reveal it much during the movie and only showed it like in small little doses and glimpses. They hid the creature in the water or and like in other movies hides the creatures in shadows like I always talk about. Like they were wise on how they decided to do that to make this believable because if they started showing a lot of the scenes they originally wanted to do for Jaws it would have looked fake and corny and wouldn't have given you that fear of terror but I think the fact that when you hide something like that it gives you that fear of your imagination running wild. Absolutely. And I think when you show the animal's perception too, like when you do the camera view of the animal, it provides you a connection with the, can with the animal. And I, you know, the first Anaconda used a lot of practical effects. And on NFW, they recently covered that and they also are, did, or they're going to be doing Blood Orchid as well. I think they actually already did Blood Orchid last week. And I've seen both of them. And Blood Orchid has a lot more CG in it. Yeah, the CG does look kind of cheesy at times, so I think practical is the way to go. What I thought was great in the 70s is that they showed animal films, but what I also have an issue with in the 70s is that they used actual animals. And I yeah, think cause... there's, yeah, there's one thing with using, like, Cujo. Cujo is not a film that I overly enjoy, uh, besides the fact there's a dog, and I love dogs, and I could stare at dogs all day. But they had two dogs for that. They had a St. Bernard and a Rottweiler because the, the Cujo dog was not, like St. Bernard was not as angry as it needed it to be. But yeah. there's a scene in Cujo, for anyone who doesn't know, Cujo gets rabies. And I, I guess I purposely didn't include Cujo, probably more because I'm not a fan. I could try to rationalize it with he gets rabies and that's why. But rabies is a, is a natural disease that animals can get. Yeah. And I don't know how accurate this patrol was of Cujo, but I remember reading about it and they had to put like yolk and egg on him just mm -hmm. <laughs> make him look all gross and nasty gross and stuff and he was just kept trying to lick it off the entire time and um there's a part where he's on top of the car and you i can i could swear you could see the trainer in the background being like dig 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 and he's and he's digging <laughs> on the roof right and they really try to make him look angry and they try with that rottweiler as well too and i'm not talking about that like i'm sure cujo the dog that played Cujo and the dog that played the Rottweiler were treated well. Like, I'm not yeah, talking about domesticated animals. I'm talking about wild animals. Yeah, say so the wild animals and then especially a lot of the Italian-style animal yes. attack films because it seems like, at least back in the 70s especially, they their animal laws weren't nearly as strict. And, like, even in the U.S., the animal laws weren't nearly as no, strict. No, North America, they filming. weren't. They weren't, right? Like, or we wouldn't have had you know, possibly actual cougar, cougars attaching, attacking stuntmen, right? There's a reason right. why circuses don't, generally speaking, have animal performers anymore. Because it's not natural for bears to wear tutus and ride bicycles. Like, that's not actually a thing. Right, So, exactly. you know, I, I, I think that it's, you know, and for the time, you know, I try to turn off my political angry hat, Heather, and I just, you know, enjoy the movie for what it is. But I think CG can be done well. Like if we look at the CG that was included in movies like Crawl, um, and I don't, I, for me, I don't know where practical ended and CG began. Someone else, maybe you can talk about that more than I can. Uh, but we look at the most recent Lion King adaptation. Like there were some animals in there that looked real. And that was oh, all yeah. CG. Well, so it can't be done. And this is something I was going to bring up next, too, because like this is all kind of goes in with what I, the topic here was was the CG, because during the like late 90s, early 2000s is when the CG came in. And at that point, unless you were a big budget film, CG didn't look that great. Yeah. But the problem is a lot of these horror films were like a lot of these eco horror films were made for TV or straight to VHS, straight to DVD style, and they didn't have the budget, so a lot of the CG didn't look nearly as good. Like, obviously, that, does, that can make or break a film for some people. For me, it's got to be the story that does it more than anything. But some of these, though, it's just one of those things I just notice is 
when you have a C if you have a low budget and you're using CGI, just don't show the creature in its full glory all the time. Mm-hmm. Like do it with like the dark lighting and stuff like that. Just kind of hide some of the effects that. Or do it from the creature the angle, the camera. Yeah. Have that being the creature. Yeah. Like what was the uh, dead stop? You didn't see that creature. Like you didn't see anything more than like its teeth in that movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's all you needed. It built up a good tension there. But absolutely. And yeah, like I think like uh, when it comes to that stuff, yeah, it just depends on how obviously preferences. Because I know uh, our friend Don and Ellie loves a lot of those uh, shark movies from the early two thousands and the ones that are still coming out. And yeah, they're not they're not for me, but I can see why someone can get some enjoyment out of them. And I have no judgment for that at all. It's just, yeah, that's for me, I don't find them that entertaining, but I think that's mainly due to the acting and the characters more than I, the creatures. I, I, I hear where you, and I think I side with Mr. Don and Ellie on this one. I, I feel with like creature features, this is how I look at it. You walk into it knowing what it's going to be about. If I'm going to watch Two Headed Shark Attack, you know, I know what two-headed shark attack is going to be, <laughs> right. right? Like, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, man, like, why is this not Academy Award winning acting and the best special effects on the entire planet? If I go to see a movie like Crawl in the cinema, I'm going to have higher expectations. Yeah. You know, I'm going to expect it to be more realistic. I'm going to expect it to be taken more seriously. And I'm fine having my foot in either camp. Like, I watched the sequel to Deep Blue Sea, which was not that good. But I well, still sat through it. <laughs> yeah, and I'll and I'll still even watch these movies, just like these types of movies that I'm not a big fan of, because like you don't know what you're gonna like unless you watch it. I and, find them fun, you know. Yeah. Like I just find them silly, silly fun. They're just uh, for for me. They're more turn your brain off and have fun. Like, but what bothers me is when you don't know what you are, and I've said this over and over again. Yes, know what you are, right? If you are a silly creature feature. And it is a, a creature that is metamorph. Like, Piranha Double D was hilarious, okay? Yeah. Like, that movie was jokes. And would anyone be like, oh, that's going to happen, and, you know, that's realistic, and that's what's going to go down in a water park? Like, of course not. No, it's just dumb, dumb fun slaughter. Things, right? Like it, but it's silly, and it's fun. And if you like that, that's great. But when I'm sitting down to watch something like Boar, Boar was supposed to be – um, realistic. So Boar came out on Shudder. Scott and I watched it back towards the end of 2019. And it's about a, a wild boar in Australia, which I think is great that they, they went away from the snakes and the spiders and the sharks and I don't know, everything else that could kill you in Australia. Yeah. And then went with a boar. Yeah, because boars are scary. Yeah, they're like, they're tough, right? And there was a scene where they showed this boar and like it, as I said before in our first episode, it reminded me of an animatronic, like cheesy dinosaur that you see at one of those like really cheesy amusement parks. You know, like I think that's what you're talking about, Scott. Like, know your budget, you know, or and not only know your budget, know what movie you're going for. If you're trying to make yeah. this serious and stuff, hide it till the end or keep it in the dark so you still keep it scary and you still keep it threatening. Because once you saw that, you're like, oh, come on, guys. Yeah, because like. <laughs> Up, up to that point, you only seen it in the shadows and like just like brief lighting and stuff like that. And I'm going, okay, I'm I'm really into this. And then they had that in full daylight showing the full bodied thing. And I'm going, oh, God, that looks so bad. And like it, like you said, yeah, it just all depends. Like you got to know what type of film you are. You do. And even though I don't care for Cujo because I find the movie a little bit long, I think the acting in that movie is very well done by the mother and the son. Oh, D. Wallace steals that movie like it, it's phenomenal and i love dogs so i would probably watch cujo again because i just love dogs so much that anything with dogs in it i like go gaga over but they took it seriously like and they tried to make cujo as scary as as they could and that dog was well trained you can't change the fact that a good natured dog and you're trying to make it vicious and angry it's it's difficult to do right like cause you yeah. don't want the dog to get out of control like there's lots of factors here but that is an example of a movie that is well done even though i may not dig it and it's not my favorite movie it doesn't mean that it's not a well presented creature feature right exactly or eco that. creature feature because it's based on a dog that gets rabies yeah yeah, that one, because uh, yeah, that one's got the believable, like, it's pretty much hits on all these things that I've been talking about, where it's, it's believable, it's got good characters, the threat is real, the reason for it being aggressive, there is good reason for it. Um, 
the use of a live animal that with dog, especially in the eighties, probably was treated pretty well. Yeah. And it like that one, it made it, it made it effective. But like you, I'm not a biggest fan of that movie. Like, I don't mind it, but yeah, I feel it's overly long. But yeah, that's a good example of like pretty much every one of these right here. And it, there's a difference between not being a fan of movie and respecting it. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like we respect that movie for what it did. And I think my issue with with the wild animal piece is not necessarily I don't think they were treated well. It's just wild animals aren't meant to be performers. Yeah. And that's, you know, we've domesticated dogs over years. We've domesticated horses over years. Like there's certain animals that have become domesticated. You know, I don't believe a bear is domesticated. I don't believe an no. orca is, is domesticated, right? So I think that's where I, I get on a little bit of my high horse and that's my own personal value. So I'm trying really hard not to present it, but it's probably coming through in full force. Um, <laughs> but it is what it is, right? But it doesn't mean that, you know, and those were from the 70s and 80s and you can't fault something that happened that long ago so i would never not support these movies because of that that's just ridiculous it's just something in the back of my mind i have to turn off when i'm watching them right exactly and it's just kind of like me when i watch what was the one i watched uh bait which is about a uh shark that gets inside of a grocery store and starts killing people because of a tidal wave that fills the place with water i had to turn i had to turn my all right, this isn't going to be taken seriously, brain off. I decided to like, just go in and just go, all right, this is going to be silly. Let's just, yep. let's just see what it's like. And yep, I will enjoy some of those films, but some of those films, I just can't. It just all really depends. But yeah, that's pretty much most of what I wanted to cover there. Uh, the one thing I did want to bring up to, and, like, to you and the audience is, where do you see these films going in the future? Like, you and I talked about climate change. So do you, do, are you agreeing with me that you'll, we'll be seeing a lot more natural horror films dealing with the climate change stuff? I don't know if they'll have animals in it. I don't know if we'll go back to the seventies of the animals, like getting pissed and taking charge. And I'm not saying that all those movies were, you know, based behind climate change. I'm giving one argument from the sixties and environmental awareness becoming clear. And that's, you know, was a flavor of these movies. Obviously, you can take, you know, simple creature feature into these movies, too. Um, I, if it makes people take climate change more seriously, yes, I would like to see that. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if we will, if it will be subtle, like you mentioned, Crawl, that that could be a subtle message. Yet again, we don't know for sure. We're just right. This putting is just it out there. Right? Um, but I think that there would be some validity to it as long as it's a serious film. So as long as it follows the same background that crawl has and 47 meters down has like, as long as we're still following the seriousness of it and seriousness of those creatures or, or back country, um, then yes, it can definitely be done. But I think that it's, uh, It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see where creature features goes, eco, eco creature features go. Yeah. So the natural animals and their natural tendencies go. Yeah, exactly. And one I just thought of that kind of ties into climate change. Um, well, it's a big part of climate change, I think, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering if we'll start seeing uh, more of these eco horror films after dealing with the bushfires in Australia. Yeah. Because then foreseeing like, you could make a story about forcing a predator out of its home and come into human environments because there's no home left for it. Like, so yeah. I could see stories. Well, this being... world was their home and we invaded it. So, yeah. um, you know, I, yeah, it will be interesting to see what comes of that too. Right. Like there's, I, I think we still have some other activities or events that have occurred that are going to be made into movies. There was the one about the soccer team that got trapped in that underwater cave like, I feel like oh, they're yeah. going to gonna expand on that and maybe throw in a shark into the mix. and <laughs> Right, they could. <laughs> just because there's also a shark threat. Um, whether there was or wasn't, doesn't matter. I think that they may just sprinkle a little bit of that in there. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see where we go from here. And, and I noticed on your notes here, the movies that we were unsure of was... I don't know if you want to bring those up. Yeah, I was actually... That was going to be the final okay. thing I brought up about this. But uh, yeah, because you and I had talked about like when we were breaking down this whole topic and what we considered a eco horror and a monster movie type one that kept coming up for us and this one's a big one is especially the first one Jurassic Park because Jurassic Park and other dinosaurs 
like obviously were real, but would they be considered eco horror just because we found DNA and recreated the dinosaurs? This is something that we've kind of were were unsure of on like what this would be considered. Would this be considered monster movie? Would this be considered eco horror, or what? And so we I want we kind of wanted to leave this up to hopefully the our audience, our listeners to give us some feedback on what they think. And, and we'll probably do a poll. I think that would probably make the most sense to. Yeah, like once this episode gets released, we'll release a poll about it after people listen to it. I think what's interesting with the Jurassic Park movies is it it takes dinosaurs, and the first one it's really scary, and it almost uh, I like all the Jurassic Park movies. Just disclosure here, I yep. I eat don't that stuff up like candy. I've watched every one of them. Uh, what was that last one? Jurassic World something. Yeah, but, I can't remember the second Jurassic World. Yeah, uh, that that one. There were certain scenes where I'm just going, "Oh, come on!" <laughs> yeah, there were some. There were some scenes that were a little cheese cheese. I find the original three um, more serious yeah. than, the, than the Jurassic World ones. Now, what I did like about the Jurassic World ones was the idea that it being a theme park and basically exploiting the dinosaurs and the dinosaurs getting pissed off and fighting back. I yep. enjoy that. Um, and the know, DNA manipulation. Oh, and the DNA and like making these super huge like crazy dinosaurs and the predator dinosaur that turns invisible (laughs) oh yeah spoiler alert for jurassic park lost world the first one the fight at the end between the raptor and the t-rex and the hybrid oh Um, my gosh like and you know what those are theater movies right like yeah exactly and you just enjoy and like you know why do all the brontosaurus has got to die you know it's my favorite dinosaur and why and why why you always killing the brontosauruses every single movie we got to have some brontosaurus death, you know? Like, why can't they just live and be happy little dinosaurs? Well, at least the one in uh, the first Jurassic Park lived and just sneezed on someone. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, they lived there. Um, but man, like, oh, they get slaughtered in the first one, first Jurassic World, and then they're, the one gets left on the dock. Oh, and that one was, that oh, scene, my oh my God. My God, I was like, what are we doing here? I can't handle this. Um, anyway, and the Meg. I think the Meg is another oh, movie. Yes, the Meg. Well, because the Meg is based on... Uh, Megalodon. Yeah, like it's it's believed to be a creature. And we found skeletons and stuff to believe that this creature existed. And it's the idea that the creature has survived. So does where does that fall, right? Yeah, yeah. Because that one's like also because it's part of the dinosaur era. Yeah. Like the, I forget what the term is, but yeah, like. Those could like I think those ones are kind of like balancing the fine lines of they could be eco horror they could be more supernatural horror more because you know they don't exist in this world as far as we know now as far as we know yeah <laughs> but at the same time like so yeah this is just something we'll have to like kind of just leave up for debate like we're not gonna just say like oh yeah we know this nope nope we're admitting that this one these ones kind of stumped us on our decision on how we wanted to put them yeah so no idea. Wanted- Yep, so we just wanted to leave it to everybody else to like maybe give us an idea or start a fun debate on our show on our page. So the last thing we wanted to uh to conclude with our final chapter of our podcast today is what we're looking forward to. And yeah. there's some trailers we watched. So should I go first, Mr. Crawford? Yeah, might as well. All right. So I will talk about the one that I saw that I think most reflects what's going on right now is the platform. Yeah. Um, won't give too much because we try to avoid spoilers in this section for those that don't watch trailers. So if you don't watch trailers and you don't want to know anything at all, please don't listen. Um, but if you don't mind knowing a, a brief overview, uh, this takes place in a prison and has to do with food shortage, shortage, which I feel is really ironic with what's, going, what's going on, on right on. now. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Right. And just the, uh, the ranking of where people are in this prison and how food is divided. It looks very well done. It's a, I don't know what the nationality is because it is subtitled. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't able to tell. Like, but it is a subtitled film, but it looks excellent. And it's coming, it's going to be a Netflix original too. So that's great. You don't have to leave your house, which yeah, exactly. you don't want to do right now anyway. So that's good. <laughs> and do you want to go with the next one? Uh, yeah, let's see. What do we got here? Uh, one that I was looking forward to. Um, this one just brings back the childhood love of 80s ridiculousness. And that is PG Psycho Gorman. Yeah, it looks pretty funny. Oh my gosh, this movie looks just right up my alley. Um, one thing I want to say, this is done by Steve Kostansky, and I forget the other guy's name, but they are the ones that 
used to be part of the Astron Six Collective, which is a Canadian film team. Um, they are also, these two are also known for their incredible makeup effects. And they also made The Void, which is one of my favorite horror films in, the, over, in this decade. And uh, Steve Kostansky went on to do The Leprechaun Returns, the newest Leprechaun, which I actually really enjoyed. Nice. So this, but yeah, this is just like basically an alien that uh, they these kids in the backyard find this like amulet that somehow awakens this alien bounty hunter type creature that wants to kill everything. But when he realizes the kids have the amulet, he has uh, he has to do everything these little kids say, and it just looks silly, entertaining, and extremely gory, and looks like it's going to be just almost like done with like an 80s nostalgia. Yeah, it looks like a fun movie. Yeah, it just and looks Hopefully it's absolutely... not too many remember berries. Remember? Oh yeah, um, I remember. I have uh, good faith in these guys cuz it's like nice. it looks like a lot of the Astron 6 guys are also involved in this as actors. Like the father in it was one of the main characters from the editor who's one of the main guys from Astron 6. And awesome. So yeah, I I, I have uh, good faith that this will just be silly, dumb fun and just like kind of give you that nostalgic feeling awesome i'm excited for it too i agree with everything you said i think it'll be a really fun movie and i think this will be a movie that people either like or not like i really think this is gonna have some real division and that is okay yep exactly and there is no release date for it yet all it said was coming soon but i'm oh yeah they don't want to put a date on because who knows right (laughs) yeah i don't put a date on for anything either and then what i think will be one of the best movies of the year i knew this was gonna be your pick um black christmas 2 no just kidding Um, (laughs) (laughs) me too part two this when you thought the me too you movement can't get any more annoying um (laughs) no candy man candy man candy man (gasps) candy man um excellent i jordan peele is the producer not the director but he also co-wrote the script and anything that jordan peele touches in my opinion is gold so uh jordan peele take my money and uh i cannot wait for this retelling of Candyman. i love the fact that it is a full black african-american cast with a african female director Mm african-american female director uh nia da costa excellent 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 i think it looks well filmed i think it looks well acted you know, uh, Scott and I had a debate about this one because of my feelings on the original Candyman, which I won't get into to right now. It's a great film, but I, I think sometimes nostalgia plays a lot into when we like films, and that's the same for me. You know, I like films sometimes, and then I rewatch them again, and I'm like, meh. Um, but I think this film is going to do this story some very, very good justice, and you know what? I may be wrong, and I'm willing to take that, but I'm pretty pumped. Yeah, I am excited for this one. Like I had told you, I'm... This will be a theater watch for sure, like Mm -hmm. day one, Um, because like you, I am a sucker for anything that Jordan Peele has his his hands involved in. Uh, But yeah, I am just curious to see, because I think this is kind of like almost a remake pseudo sequel in a way. I don't know. I don't get that feeling. I think it's a retelling. the The main character, I did find this out, is the baby from the first movie. Okay. So I think it's just kind of like a sequel that takes place way in the future and he's older. But I but I think it's still gonna like, you know, be a retelling in a way as as well. Cool. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm kinda curious to see what they do with it. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And I love the uh use of the Candyman theme with uh crap, what was the hell uh say my name? Mm -hmm. Destiny Child. By Destiny's Child. Yeah, I love Jordan Peele's remixes. Yeah. Oh my god, like I heart Jordan Pruitt Peel. Like I know some people don't dig him, but man do I like him. But mind you, he he speaks to my language. Jordan yes, Peel and I, we we have a similar vision. So he's he works for me. Everyone has their director, and he is my man. I am so yep. down with him. Anything that he's involved in, like I said, I am yeah. all about to. And I am very curious to see where this film goes because I am yeah, very excited and have, have high hopes. High high hopes. Um and then another one that this one, uh, both of us were kind of excited about when we seen the trailer, and that is the A24 film, Saint Maud. And wow, this film looks intense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm still not sure, like, but this, 
feels like an exorcist style exorcism style film but i'm it's kind of hard to tell from the trailer and that's one thing that 824 is always good at is keeping you on your toes on what type of film this is really going to be yeah i i think that this will be a very popular film I think it will be well received within our community and I think it will be a movie that gives me nightmares. Yeah, cuz this one has some very <laughs> horrifying imagery. Well, even the even the concept, I do think there's some demon or ghost part of this and um yeah. you know, as I said earlier, I that's my that's something I am afraid of. That is something that I do believe in. So, anytime a, a film capitalizes on that fear, I'm I'm all down. Yeah, and I am very like as soon as I seen this, I'm like, yep, this one gives me like that just uncomfortable feeling, mm-hmm. like when just watching the trailer. So I am so looking forward to seeing this. It looks very unique and cool. Absolutely. And then finally, the last one, Scare Package, looks yeah. cool. Yeah, just like a seven uh, different director anthology, and it looks funny and violent, and it really didn't sh- like. It just kind of looked like it was splitting all of the stories and like intertwining them all together in the trailer. Yep. So I'm kind of curious to see how this plays out and like, but yeah, I am, I, I am a big fan of anthologies. Me so too. I'm, and I think this one's going to be rather silly. So I think people are either going to really dig it or they're not. Yeah. You know, and I like silly horror. So I, I think I'm going to be down with this. Yep, exactly. I am the same way. Like anything that can get a laugh out of me and still be like, kind of freaky at the same time hell yeah yeah but you don't like you don't like things are too cheesy you draw the line at some stuff yeah i'll say yeah i'll say it's very weird with me like because comedy is very subjective yeah you're it depends if it if it's black comedy you like it like dark comedy you're down but if it's like sharknado comedy not always because i love the scary movie franchise like so do i well you don't like all of them no 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 yeah let's say a franchise no, like I do right. love the first two. I like all of them. Like I could sit through all of them, even the ones that get real bad, right? One yeah. of my favorite non-horror movies is not another teen movie. I do love that movie. Right? So um, it would be interesting to see what your thoughts are on uh, on this one when it comes out. Yeah, I am very curious. Like, and because plus it's an anthology, so I may like one story and hate the rest or yeah. you know, vice versa. You never know. Absolutely. That's the thing with anthologies, right? And I guess the only other thing is if the world goes back to normal, um, <laughs> yeah, we plan on going to. We could not go to Motor City Nightmares tier, but there is another convention in May in Detroit called Motor City Comic Con. Yep, and that one happens. Yeah, mid May. And that one happens to have Milo, which is my favorite singer of all time. And uh, there's a meet and greet. So if that goes down, my ass is meeting Meatloaf for the first time. So hopefully I don't look like a blumbling fool when that occurs. Yeah, and we will definitely be talking about that when we go. Because, like, obviously that'll probably be like our, like, three episodes from now. But yeah, we'll have another one in April and then one in May. And then we'll be, yeah, so probably in the one in May, we'll be fresh off of it. And, um, and it, there's some horror there. But I'll be honest, my yeah. main motivation is Meatloaf now. That is... Uh, I have that count that date circled on my calendar is the day that my dream comes true. Yep. And I, as soon as I mentioned comic con, like I didn't even get a chance to look at the guest list. All of a sudden Heather's just like, Oh my God, me love. I'm going, uh, yep. I, I think she's one over. We're going to this. Yep. Done. <laughs> Hook line sinker. Yeah. Yep, and it has like Mick Foley. Mick Foley is going to be there. Uh, a Nick lot of Frost. people are going to be there. Yeah, it's a huge line. Matthew Lillard, Rachel D. Cook. Like there's some really well-known people that are going to be at this event. So, you know, Hey, you make lemon lemonade out of lemons, and uh, hopefully uh, the world's healthier by May fifteenth. <laughs> right, and, and we'll the, be able to have this happen. And we'll be able to like you know cross borders and stuff. Yeah, you know, typical things without going to quarantine yourself for fourteen days afterwards. But right. I guess that's it. I can't think of anything else that's coming up. I guess we can uh, do some uh, talk about our guest spots. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? All right. So yep, tonight, like I had mentioned earlier, I will be on the horror returns. And we'll be doing the March Madness with the final girl stuff and the final boys. Um, Then next week, you and I will also be on the Horror Returns. Um, We're going to be covering Videodrome, The Keep, and I can't remember what the other film was. Do you remember? No. I'll say it was another one that I uh, knew. Oh, The Hunger. The Hunger. That's what it was. Um, And then a week after that, we're going to be doing the all Canadian show with our boys from Bay and Blood. We've allowed 
Scott to join us. Yep, because I am Michigan, so I am part Canadian in that way. <laughs> is what how how we uh, justified it. Close enough to the border. Yeah, exactly. Just like anybody from like Buffalo, New York. <laughs> yep, exactly. Right. Like we're we're your Canadian brothers in arms, even if we are U.S. or Minnesota or Seattle. Yeah, a lot of states that do line other Canadian provinces, Maine, um, yeah. to to East Coast. So there, you know, it, it does happen. But yep, yeah, it's going to be an all Canadian horror show talking about Canadian horror films, and it, I think that will be a lot of fun. Maybe blast. Yep, and then um, then we have a future show with the no no more room in hell. Well, uh, the date isn't for sure set in stone on that one, but. And I'm sure we will have even more podcasting guest spots popping up from here. Yeah, we've been getting around quite a lot, and we've been sharing them all to our page. Um, so it's it's been it's been an adventure. Um, we've been very lucky and blessed to be on the podcast that we've been on. And you know, for me, who's very green, Scott's had way more experience of podcasting than I have. But it's been uh, it's been a slice. So thank you, everyone, for your support. Yeah, And thank you, as always, to our fearless leader, Jerry Herring at Kill the Cast, and our boys, Jay and Kenneth, as well, um, for being letting us be part of the Kill the Cast family. Uh, Scott has a t-shirt now, so he, yes. he fits in with the rest of us, so that's good. One um, of us. One, one of us. us. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you again to all of our listeners and, and your support and your great feedback on our show. We really do appreciate it. Um, this is really fun for Scott and I, and it's great that we can talk about these different themes and um, we're glad that you guys are enjoying it and we appreciate any feedback you provided. Absolutely. And yes, feel free to join our page, uh, the Friday nightmares podcast on Facebook. It's been pretty active on there and we've had some good interactions. So I can't wait to have more people involved and see what type of discussions we can have on there. Perfect. Well, I guess that's it. Yep. That is the end of our show. So until next time, Unpleasant dreams.